No, no, we're not live yet. We're not live oh, yet. Sorry. <laughs> you wait. You wait until I speak. No, we're, we're now we're live. So okay. Um, okay. What were you gonna say? Seriously. Okay, I was gonna. You can just call me serious, not seriously. Like just just serious. Seriously. Yeah. Yes. I can call you. Serious. Okay. Yes, you can call me serious or seriously, but regardless, um, Victor. So, can I ask? Oh God, wait. I'm. There's. Hold up. I'm getting echo. Did I accidentally? I don't think so. I'm not hearing echo. Victor, are you hearing echo? Let uh, me. Let me. I can hear some quick. background noise, but not echo. I'm not hearing echo. Victor, are you hearing echo? Oh. Let me, let me. Sorry. Now, and I was hearing my phone, but now I, I don't Fuck. hear anything. Okay. I, I for some reason the stream was open. I'm so sorry. That was embarrassing. You okay. ruined everything. Yes, I've ruined everything. So, Victor, can I can I just ask? Are, are you, do you make it just like a, a distinction between physicalism and materialism, or are you just? Uh... That's a good question. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I I would say there is uh, certainly a difference there, but it depends obviously on the labels. Now I know that normally there are people that that say, okay, physicalism is just the position that you can describe everything through the language of physics, right? And even in some place where the, the where we found the existence of uh, supernatural things, okay, things that are like angels or spirits and that kind of things, uh, we could still describe them in physical terms. They would still need to obey a certain set of laws and, and, and all of these things. Uh, I would make that distinction in that sense. Now, my general, now obviously, there's no one materialism, okay? Materialisms have differed all throughout history in almost all of the places. Now, the thing that I think all materialisms have in common, and now I'm going to explain uh, at some point what my version of materialism is, I think that all the materialists have in common one thing, which is the denial of the existence of spiritual substances. Okay, The denial of the existence of some kind of spiritual substance. Now, we can define also what we mean by spiritual substance, because in my tradition of materialism, this gets, uh, in a sense, improved upon a little bit more uh, because normally naive Marxists, Marxist, uh, naive Marxists that defend some kind of materialism that I do not defend, they would often say things like, uh, okay, the spiritual is that which is not material, okay? And obviously, we deny the existence of the spiritual. Therefore, everything that exists is material. Now, my definition of spirituality and of spiritual substances includes one concept, and, and, and here I should first of all explain what branch of materialism I subscribe to and everything else, but it includes one key concept, which is the concept of life. Okay, It has to be living, uh, uh, living spiritual substances. Okay, that, that is really important, but uh, continue with your question, and, and then at some point I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start giving the, the entire, you know, dissertation on, on materialism <laughs> and, and, I mean that that was my only question because I, I want to know exactly what I'm arguing against, I guess. So is the first topic uh, free will Sunday? Is that the first what we're talking about? Well we, um, is it all just interrelated? What precipitated this conversation last panel uh, was discussions of freedom uh, mm -hmm. and 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 things of that sort. And that made reference to substance dualism on I think Danny's view. And yeah. I can't recall if it did on yours. It did. But that was that was effectively it. And you, you, you seem to basically be going down kind of a Kantian route where you kind of have these two separate causalities. Hi Danny. Um you hey. kind of have these you kind of have these two separate causalities that you can refer to so that you can have um will not being uh somehow governed by um like the sort of causalities intrinsic to the material world or however you weird philosophers describe this kind of thing. Um that was sort of my read on that, and then we agreed to you know, discuss discuss dualism in the context of that. In this, okay. Case. Well, can I can I just clarify that real quick? Because I I I am, well, I am a dualist, but I don't think that there are like uncaused mental states. For example, like I, I don't think that that's coherent. Like I, I feel like on the free will question, um, Victor and I are going to agree on everything except what we call it. Um, that. Do you and, think? Are are you just just for 
my clarification, then are you going to be proposing um, that one substance is emergent from another? Well, yeah. So I, I do think that I do think that uh, consciousness is an emergent property of the brain, but I don't think that um, I, I think that they're not best described the same way. Like I don't think that it makes sense to describe consciousness in physical terms because it seems like consciousness exhibits properties that don't line up with our current understanding of physical terms or physical uh, processes. If that makes any sense. Well, identity theorists are going to agree with that, though, right? They're like um, smart a physicalist or identity theorist thinks that you can't get from mental terms to physical terms, but nonetheless, there's a they carry the same reference, right? Um, so while the, there's no translatable, um, you can't translate from one to the other, but they're going to refer to the same thing. At least that's how most identity theorists cash it out. I, I don't know that I. I, I don't know that it's possible to, in principle, know if they refer to the same thing is the problem. I, I don't think that you can know that. Because okay, well, go ahead. I, I'm trying. I'm trying to figure out how to explain this. Like, it doesn't seem to me like consciousness has properties that I would expect from something that's physical. Because I used to be a physicalist. Um, I, I feel like that was kind of just like the default position, like, oh, you know, everything is kind of physical. But when I started to think about like my own consciousness, I, I felt like there were things that I couldn't explain in physical terms. So like, for example, I think it's perfectly coherent to make a, a perfectly accurate prediction. Oh, shoot. My camera is getting blurry. Sorry. I think it's perfectly coherent to make a, a prediction about what would happen physically. So for example, I, I think that if you had enough variables um, present, you could make perfectly accurate uh, predictions on everything that would happen in the universe, minus like some uh, quantum randomness, right? But I don't think that that's true for uh, the mental. I think that it's you run into like incoherence when you try to say that you could perfectly predict your own thoughts with absolute certainty. Um, yeah, there's a lot going on there, but I'm saying that most physicalists agree, will agree with you that you can't describe, um, well, your, the mental terms won't translate to the to physical terms, that they're going to be two different domains of language and that you could sort of alternate between the domains in order to describe the entity in question. So. Yeah, but I, I think it's more than that. Like, I, it's not just that they don't describe it. It's just like, I don't think that they, it makes sense. I, I don't think it can be reconciled, really. Like, there's a bunch of problems that I have with certain things. If, if the mind is entirely physical, it would imply certain things about it that don't map on to our experience of the mind at all. I mean, I think I, on the whole of it, I might agree. I'm just, um, maybe there's stuff to parse out in terms of exactly what you mean. Um, because I think that at least with respect to, yeah, with respect to intentionality, there's going to be a normative feature of intentionality on my view. And then also, um, this first person, third person distinction is where really it gets me in terms of why certain forms of physicalism won't work. Um, because I don't think you can analyze a first person kind of thing um, in a third person kind of way, right? So, oh, so do you, is this, when you say a first person, third person, do you mean like you couldn't like put yourself into another person's perspective fully? kind of thing that, yeah that has that's kind of along the lines that um there <laughs> i guess to to put it in layman's terms there's nothing that you can tell me about what it's like for me to look at my screen right now like i already know what that's like you couldn't in principle um uh reveal to me what it's what it's like for instance yeah um, and i i might even go um 
I would expand on that and say that I can't in principle know what it's like for you to do that because in order for me to know that I would have to be you. Yeah. Something like that. Exactly. Yes. I think that another way of understanding the, this first person, third person stuff is that whatever's in the third person point of view, that that kind of thing is equally accessible to all psychologies, right? So electrons and protons, for instance, are in principle accessible to all psychologies, like any, despite your background, despite your background beliefs and experiences and um, what you know about others' backgrounds and experiences, you can, in principle, come to know uh, an elect what an electron is or what an electrical charge is or something like that. I, I would like us to start maybe this conversation uh, on free will, and, and this is going to get linked to the other topics that we had in mind. Sure. Uh, probably we should start maybe with giving a brief introduction to our position on the question, right? So that we can start debating it from there. Uh, because otherwise, if we start just giving random thoughts, maybe it's gonna be, it's gonna be discrete. It's not gonna be this continuum that uh, is uh, maybe a little yeah, bit better for the conversation. Mark, yeah. yeah. So yeah, do we something. just want to go around the circle, I guess, and talk about what our views on free will are? Should we hold hands while we're doing it? I don't yeah. know. <laughs> yeah. Wait. Wait. Yeah. Oh, that, doesn't, that doesn't work. Okay. Uh, no, it's the way. Just don't, 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 don't even humor that. Just keep All going. Right. Right. Um, uh, okay. Uh, I guess I can start. Seriously, yeah. Than yeah you're not so I'm a compatibilist there. about free will. I think that... Um, you're a coward. Got it. So yeah. Go uh, so, I, I mean, I used to be a hard determinist, but I, to me... I'll get into my arguments of why I'm a I'm a compatibilist. Uh, Victor, you can go next. Okay. Uh, okay. So so to deal with this question, uh, I first want to lay out a little bit my ontology and then define what I mean by freedom, very quickly, and then just give my position on it. And let let me start by saying, okay, in ontological terms, that I consider myself a materialist, and a materialist coming from the philosophical tradition of philosophical materialism, okay, which is a tradition that is uh, encapsulated in the school of thought of Gustavo Bueno, who is a Spanish philosopher, who, in my opinion, in a sense, uh, developed the materialism okay, that was already present in, in thinkers of, of the likes of Marx. okay, And he did uh, to Marx, in a sense, what Marx did to Hegel, only that Marx was already doing it to himself, okay, but he never finished. Now, what this materialism is, is two things, okay? It's a materialism that is neither monist nor corporeist, okay? What I mean by monist is that it's not monist, is that it is pluralist, but not because it accepts the existence of different worlds, of different substances. It accepts the plurality of genders of matter that exist within this uh, world, within this universe, okay? And this can be divided into three. Now, I'm not going to go into detail on, on these categories and whatsoever, but the important thing is that when we talk, for example, about ideas, ideas are not a different kind of substance. They are still material, but they are a different gender of material substances. Okay, So uh, we deny, of course, the existence of spiritual substances, and the way in which we define spiritual substances is as living things that have no body, that are in a sense, that are disembodied, okay? Living things that are disembodied because not everything that is material is embodied, okay? There are some immaterial things which are disembodied, and this is important. Now, knowing this, okay, about ontology and uh, and, and having defined it very quickly what my ontology is, uh, I would like to go to the question of uh, freedom, okay? What is freedom? Now, freedom, I don't think there's such thing as death freedom, okay, freedom. There are different categories of freedom, there are different uh, degrees of freedom, okay, and freedom refers primarily, all of those categories have in common one thing, which is that they refer to the capacity to act, okay, and this is neither, a, and this is not a exclusively human property, okay, this is a property of living things, okay, living things have the capacity to act, my cat, for example, has the capacity to act, and they have different degrees of freedom, and degrees of freedom here is the really important thing, because there's no one freedom, okay, that we can talk about. There are different uh, freedoms pertaining to different activities, okay? Now I have, for example, the degree of freedom of being able to move my arm in these directions, okay? Whether this uh, 
these movements that I'm doing are caused by uh, in, in, in the determinist sense or on cost in any other sense doesn't matter to this definition of freedom, okay? Because freedom is just the ability to act. And there are things that impede us from acting, from acting and those are things that, in a sense, remove degrees of freedom. But you never have this, like, full freedom, okay? This, like, the freedom. There's no ideal freedom. There's different freedom. This is a, a dialectical understanding. Now, with these two things in mind, now the way in which I define free will, okay, is the capacity to act according to some kind of a, a unconstrained will that can either be, you know, immaterial in the sense, in the dualist sense of it lives in a different world and it causes these actions, okay, but it itself doesn't have any cause. And in this sense, okay, I obviously deny this because of the spiritual sense. Now, if you want to, if, if we talk about free will in this sense, of course, free will doesn't exist. And there are many you know, studies that we can point to that suggest that this kind of free will doesn't exist. But, of course, we can define free will in a different sense, okay, which is just acting according to one's uh, motives, to one's uh, will, which may not necessarily be this kind of uncaused or maybe this spontaneous thing, okay, that in philosophy has also been discussed a lot, okay, of free will being caused by some kind of a, of a, of a spontaneous uh, substance that we don't really know about okay uh, now regardless of how you call it this particular definition of free will which is the free will that uh, in a sense is comes from an unconstrained will okay from some kind of a substance that is unconstrained and that causes our actions okay this kind of free will doesn't exist for sure now we can talk about compatibilism and in that sense i can be in, indeed a compatibilist okay depending on how you define free will but uh, with this being said, I think I'll really lay out the, the basics. Okay, so Danny can go next if he wants. Yeah, um, I'm also a compatibilist. I guess there are different senses of freedom, but I think that the, the valuable sense of freedom, I guess, comes in two forms for me. Um, number one, the, yeah, the ability, I like Vic's um, sense of, of ability that rather we're shifting freedom to be not about will, but to be about action. Um, we're all, but I also want to understand freedom in terms of succeeding with respect to what you value most or what you desire most. Uh, so that, uh, I think that's pretty common in our, um, in our colloquial settings where things get in the way of our desires and that kind of impedes our freedom. But I think there's another aspect of freedom where, um, when, once we have a value or a desire, um, and that desire sort of is uh, motivates our behaviors um, or our, our actions. I think that should sufficiently explain our actions. Um, that there's not going to be um, an explanation, kind of uh, whether you consider over and above or under an underlying explanation that um, uh, that's auxiliary to our desire that factors into why we do one action rather than another. I think, in other words, when I say that I had some reason to come here or some desire to come here, that's sort of the ultimate explanation for, or at least the immediate. You were lying, weren't you? you? You didn't really want to come here at all. You're just trying to make me feel nice. <laughs> hey, Pogan. Um, uh, but yeah, no, I'm just saying that um, when we cite our reasons as explanations, I feel like that's a sufficient explanation to outsource um, to laws or the fact that desires reduced down to like material things like electrons or neurons, right? Is sort of doing a disservice to that explanation. And that's just put it to put it briefly. All right, All right. Um, Hogan, uh, I don't know how much of the conversation uh, you were here for, but we're just uh, outlining our positions vis-a-vis -vis freedom and well, that's that's about it. Like, what what, what is freedom? What is the relationship relationship between freedom and free will, um, etc.? Yeah, we we were all giving our positions on compatibilism versus determinism versus libertarian free will. If you want to, have we done any intentional realism? Did Danny drop the uh, the robot bluefish blowfish uh, thought experiment yet? Have we gotten that far? No, no. I have not. Um, I'll listen for a little bit and then give my thoughts as it comes up. So, Okay, sure. 
So I, I, I guess what I'll start by saying is that I, I think most of us are probably going to agree with Victor when he says that there is no like thing outside of the body that you know is uncaused but causes our actions kind of thing. Like I, I think that most of us. Does anybody disagree with that? Just to just to be sure that we're all on the same page. Well, there's two. There's a, there's a conjunction, right? There's this thing outside their body, and then there's this thing that's uncaused, mm -hmm. right? So, I don't really think that the mind um, is reducible to bodily states or physiological states. Um, but I think you know I accept that that I accept determinism. So I don't think it's like I think there's an explanation. Uh, so of course the, the mind cannot be reduced to them in in a, in an explanatory sense okay when we are explaining this this uh, phenomena this mental phenomena it cannot be uh, just reduced to the to the purely uh, bodily but uh, in, in the sense that i was describing before the the different genders of nature okay the different uh, genders of mat of uh, of matter sorry uh, I think that this encompasses, uh, this notion encompasses really well this problem, okay, which is there is a discontinuum, okay, in the, in the, in the Platonian, in the Platonic sense of simple, okay, okay, which is that there is a discontinuum, not all things are related to each other, and there is a discontinuum, a discrete set of uh, genders of matter, okay, and you cannot necessarily reduce ones to the others. And in this sense, uh, mental states cannot be reduced to the bodily states, but they are themselves an emergent property. That that is the that is why we say that there are no such thing. There's no such thing as a disembodied mind, because minds are emerging from bodies, and therefore they depend on the bodies. But yeah, they are discreetly that, different. From it depends on how you're characterizing emergence. There, um, there's like a simple sense of emergence where like the sort of parts come together, and and then the whole has like very different properties in the parts that come together um but that that sense of emergence i don't think the mind is emergent from the body in that sense um there might be a dependency relation but um th that's going to get tricky it depends on what kind of dependency relation you're talking about um but that that if you say there's a dependency relation that might still you know there's going to be an open question about whether you accept physicalism or dualism, but it is, and as far as the aspects of nature, you call them genders of nature, right? I think that's another thing to explore what you mean by nature there, um, because there might not be any disagreement if you're just characterizing nature in a certain way, but yeah. I was talking about genders of matter, okay? And, and, I, and I obviously say that everything in nature is material, but I don't think that material is just that which is bodily that which has a body okay because i was saying that my form of materialism is not a corporate materialism and it's ne neither an uh, um, a monist okay i said very well that it is pluralist and in this sense okay you can indeed have immaterial uh, sorry uh, uh, disembodied things that are still material for example mental states mental states are material but nevertheless they are disembodied in the sense that they themselves don't have a body, and we can still talk, for example, about some of the concepts in geometry, some of the concepts in in certain uh, branches of mathematics, which themselves don't have a body, but nevertheless they still exist and they are material. Yeah, I just wouldn't characterize it that way. Like I just wouldn't, ever, I wouldn't say some mental state is material. But I guess you mean something different by material than I do. Exactly by material, I just mean that which is not a living spiritual substance. A living speech, and this is why I was talking about um, a living as a really important concept in this in this definition of materialism, because normally, okay, the way in which uh, materials have been criticized is by talking about things which are uh, disembodied, okay, and they don't have a life. So they say, okay, these things disprove the, the the claim that everything which exists is material. But what I say is those things are material too. What is a spiritual, what is non-material, is that which is living and it is disembodied. Okay, this is why I say that we don't consider the existence of disembodied minds. Is there anything that, so for example, the the, the laws the, the laws of logic, for example, they are not living; they don't have a life. Nevertheless, 
they exist and they are material. I'm feeling called out well, here. Well, okay, but the laws of logic only exist within our perception. Like, there are forms of our intuition. Like, if all humans exist, or cease to exist, or if all beings cease to exist, what would it mean for the laws of logic to exist? Why do you, why do you think the laws of logic are dependent on agents to contemplate them? Why do you think, because like I, it's, it's, it's a pretty well debated philosophical issue, whether or not the laws of logic are mind contingent or not. I take the view that if I were to snap my fingers and Thanos everybody out of existence, right, including myself, the laws of logic would still be fundamental facts about, well, the universe in a, in a sense. But I'm, I'm curious as to why you think they're mind dependent. So I, I, the reason I don't think that they're mind dependent, or at least I don't think, Rather, I don't think that we have sufficient reason to believe that they aren't mind dependent, because I think that there are a lot of things that we take to be fundamental that are actually just mind dependent. So something that's, for example, is a uh, temporality. Um, the universe doesn't actually have temporality in the way that we experience it. Like we experience things in a chronology, but our best scientific theories suggest that actually the universe doesn't have a temporality it's eternalist right All so you would reject something like you would reject something like platonism then i, I like abstract objects yeah sure i think so yeah i'm a nominalist about mathematics i think but i i digress the point is is that um sorry i i I, I lose my train of thought very easily. So you were responding to Victor saying that the laws of logic are in some sense. Yes, 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 yes. So we, we know, or at least our best scientific experiments seem to suggest that chronology is just a habit of the mind. It's not real, right? And if we can say that chronology is, which is something that's super fundamental to our perception, if we can say that that is... Um, non-existent or just a form of our intuition, then why is it inconceivable that something like non-contradiction or identity or whatever is also just a form of our intuition and not something that, and not something that like really exists, quote unquote. In the well, I think, can I, I, I think, can I, this very quickly? Can I yeah. very quickly just jump in just because yeah, well. I'm going to be silent for another 30 minutes afterwards. Just very quickly. Thank you, Zan, for being patient. Um, I guess my, my immediate response to that though is, uh, these these notions that you say could kind of uh sort of in in reality quote unquote sort of beyond the form of our intuition they, they might they might in some sense hold true my only issue there would be like maybe that's we can sort of entertain that as a possibility but it also seems like a lot of these ideas are themselves dependent upon those things holding true for them to even be thought in the first place so why would we even why would we even think of them Zen? Uh, I, I just I I wanted to probe further into what is the um, what are the scientific theories you're referring to that kind of suggest that temporality is a trick of the mind and the natural state of the universe is a temporal. Um, uh, I I'm I'm, I'm, just, I'm talking about um I'm talking about relativity. So yeah, I, my my understanding of relativity is that temporality seems to be. Um, a natural consequence of gravitational interactions Correct. between things. So when you condense matter into a position where it's actually able to um, influence the fabric of space-time, temporality is a natural emergent feature from this as you basically take momentum in whatever way you want to put it out of a, kind of like a, an instantaneously causal event. Um, okay. Temporality seems to be what the universe does to rectify relativity. So, so yeah, go on. can I respond to that? So yeah. the, when I say that the universe is not temporal, I mean that all points in time are equally real to one another. Yeah. Do you disagree with that? Okay. No, no, I, I agree with that. It, it's it's exactly like you said in relativity. It's that um, our our experience of time is entirely relative to where we are in relation to where we everything else is. Yeah, but th there is no privileged perspective, right? And no. on one frame of reference a simultaneous event can be a one after the other event right so yeah well, so I, the reason i was confused because it, it felt like you were privileging the atemporal for instance like um, a photon 
it felt like you were privileging that position when that's just that's an example of something that doesn't no. experience so, its own gravity yeah so this is what i mean though is that like i'm not i'm not trying to privilege the atemporal so much as i'm trying to show that there are other frames of reference that are that way and as such it seems weird to say that like we take chronology to be like really fundamental to our perception, but we know, or at least scientific experiments suggest that there are other frames of reference that don't have those same properties. And I don't, and given that something as fundamental as chronology can be shown to be relative, I don't see why logical laws necessarily must differ from that too. <coughs> Yeah, um, you're saying that this is an empirical issue, though. I mean, it seems like if it's a metaphysical hypothesis, it's going to be interesting what's meant by that science is verifying one thesis over another. So, um, I, I don't know. I, like, I, I'm, I, I don't know. I, I think that this inference is not like, I'm not going to make a deductive argument for why the laws of logic aren't universal. I'm just saying that like, I don't think I'm, I'm advancing a skeptical hypothesis here, which is that I don't think it's possible for you to say with confidence that the laws of logic like really exist in the way in like the strong sense. Well, there's, there's two problems here. There's like the ontology of propositions and then there's just the truth values of these propositions. Um, like, we're conflating them you might think that these propositions don't exist whatever that means but also think that we can talk in a way where there's always going to be these truths right um maybe you, you know that might sound kind of weird but like nominalists are not going to disagree that there are necessary truths right they're not going to disagree to that yeah there are, i think there are necessary truths with respect to um, our experiences, like, I don't think that, I, I don't think that it's possible for like a human to rationally deny the law of non-contradiction. It's just that I'm not comfortable saying that it's impossible for some being to exist that doesn't have the same set of logical principles that we do. Yeah. I just it, is, is the argument that we just won't share them identically or that only we'll have them? Um, like, what do you, what do you mean the way that? I put it like that, um, I am perfectly confident that um, like if there are alien civilizations out there, they will have what we would call mathematics. I just think it's very unlikely that we would even recognize what they're talking about unless we spot the pattern. Like unless we spot like the pattern of prime numbers, it'll it'll be um, we'll recognize the, the reproducible patterns in nature, but we will have no idea what they're calling it or how they denote it. I mean, sure, but what if it's, what if they just have completely different forms of intuition to us? But like, you, when you're doing what if, you're kind of, like, it seems like it's presupposing. I, I'm giving the skeptical hypothesis. That's what I said, right? Yeah, but you need to presuppose the moda a modality for a skeptical hypothesis. How, I do. It is worth taking seriously because the presence of a what if is downstream of our own consciousness. So it is a real thing. Like so we're able to words, create these hypotheticals. I'm trying so to say, they, they are worth taking seriously. So you, what I'm but, trying to say, series, is um, that possibility is parasitic on these laws, right? You, you. It, I don't know what possibility would be without these laws, uh, these necessary truths. Um, so when you're saying that there, there might be, or there's possibly a case where you have different beings with a very different type of modality, logical modality, right? Then you're already kind of in that possible now You world. could, you could though, you could broaden it a little bit and you could be saying, well, these, these terms we're using, we're talking about how they might obtain, um, as, as a function of some other, the structure of some other form of life's conscious experience or whatever, or is something that obtains just in the world sort of beyond um, sense and experience. Um, you could you could argue that we're just using those terms by analogy. There's something sort of in that domain out there somewhere. It's not what we're referring to, but we're kind of gesturing at it that way. <clears throat> yeah. That's sort of but, the move that context. Sorry, no, so I, I definitely, I agree with you someday. Uh, so 
Have you guys ever seen the movie Arrival? Like, yeah. okay. Yes. So, yeah. so that's so that just as an example, Arrival, like in in the movie, just spoilers. The aliens in the movie perceive things atemporally, so they don't perceive things in chronology. Everything per is perceived by them all at once, and we can talk about that. We can say everything they perceive is all at once, but we can't actually conceptualize what that means, right? We can like gesture at it. Wait, you don't know what it means then to say that you can perceive. Um, I don't. I, mean, I don't know well, what you mean. By can you perception. can you really know what that means? Like you can't even perceive well, that because like you, in, I mean, is there is there a distinction between that proposition and googly lock lock? I mean, it um, seems like I mean, you're 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 telling me that it's an intelligible statement to say yeah. that these aliens do are perceiving this way. Yeah. Right, so then it's meaningful. It's meaningful, but we can't Google actually right. experience. Let's let seriously reply. Yeah, but we can't actually experience what it is. Like I, I think that that's Sunday a different put question. It it's, right? it's, it's not it, actually. Go ahead, then. Sorry. You can say that a bird perceived a rock, but that perception is not a qualitative, um, and not a qualitative. Uh, it doesn't imply qualia, right? All I take a perception <laughs> to be is something like there is an external. Uh, thing that forms or gives an agent or mind a belief. That's all and I need. To, to corroborate what Danny is saying, I, I, within the scope of the movie, like the aliens, despite experiencing um, things non-linearly with respect to time, are still able to um, meaningfully communicate with the humans in the, in question, right? They meet, they they convey meaningful sentences and they express concepts that are meaningful. The point being. Um, I don't actually accept this idea, like he said, that there's something that's meaningless about an atemporal understanding of time from our perspective. I don't know why a human being would would struggle with the concept of things being <clears throat> atemporal or non-linear or anything like that. It just seems like something that's being asserted. I, a okay, key so part of that movie is that she actually did learn it. So she was... That too, to yeah. She, she, at the end, she actually does... Yeah. Yeah, but I, that's, I, I do I understand that's the different. point you're making, though, is because, for instance, like we breathe oxygen. Um, fish can't breathe oxygen. They need to filter it through their gills. So we can we can kind of imagine what that system is like, despite having no idea what it feels like. So I here. think I know what you're getting at. Is that maybe you here, something here, let me let me let me let me have the uh, the, the, the non philosophical uh, intervention quickly for my clarification. Mm -hmm. um, one of the reasons why I find that unsatisfying is that it seems, Danny, that you you sort of shifted the burden to this notion of belief that is, as of yet, um, not not really specified. Uh, and it seems to me like seriously sort of reacting to the uh, the the arrival example where she does actually learn it. Well, I mean, we're, we're we're sort of it's indicated to us by the film that she learns it, but we as the audience don't learn it, no, nor do we actually have a strong sense of what that even means. Um, with respect to the absence of qualia, we, we seem to intuitively, at least in terms of how we talk about these things, we seem to think that understanding or, or learning or these kinds of things, they involve in some sense, some onboarding of something that exists kind of indubitably as a part of your experience. And your, your beliefs aren't just like an abstract situation. They bear a specific relationship to our experience that's distinct from other trivial facts about the world. So if, if you wanted to elaborate on, on, that if any of that made sense um that would actually think well all i was saying is that if someone tells me that there's this being that perceives all in, in one at one moment in one moment or what was the i think that's how i understood it time is perceived non-linearly i don't know what that okay now i don't well, let, let's, leave, let's leave it let's leave it let's leave it less specified than that let's just say like t time time is either perceived differently or or something uh, approximating to time isn't perceived at all like something something like that like there's, there's just there's just some way in which mm -hmm. there's the some, key aspect uh, of how their language worked is that it doesn't have a perceived chronology to the way they structure a symbol it is it is itself a temporal symbol that takes place over like years and years that's the problem with the, the disagreement and the understanding because when humans come to interact with that idea and this is the origins of the movie they're, they're thinking of it like, okay, I'm reading this right now. Where is this going? Whereas that alien, that symbol 
represents years of ideas compacted into one thing. And she only starts to understand this when she learns that language and thinks that way. That's that's the plot of the movie. Yeah. Yeah, look, I, there might be something there. I was just contesting the fact that there could be different sets of necessary truths because when you're saying there could, and necessary truths here, we're talking about logical truths, logical, like Victor brought up the laws of logic, right? That's what I'm talking about. And when I heard that someone said, I think Siri said, well, I'm being skeptical. There could be, there's a possible world, in other words, where these beings have different necessary truths. And I'm saying that's presupposing the necessary <laughs> truth already by just stipulating that possible world. Uh, I, how so? I think okay, when you right. say that, yeah. there is no, some no, you're, you're accepting the category. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm accept. okay, I'm accepting that it's possible. Well, here's okay. here's the point that's being made, I think, seriously. Um, when we're talking about the form of our intuition, we're talking about the kinds of categories that we sort of intuitively have as, as like, as a, a part of how, how we experience things. If you're trying to say that that differs between species, well, we can't make reference to those categories again to talk about the different varieties of those things that, that there could be. Because you're, you're again, you're, you're presuming again, like a specifically human stance then. Yeah, but I, how is that different for atemporality? Because well, atemporality still... is not part of like logical laws, right? Um, all right. It's I mean, not part of logical laws, but it's fundamental to our perception, I would say. Fundamental, like it's like, like you're just, you're giving a, some kind of transcendental argument and that's fine. But I think what Victor originally said is that there's these, there's the law of identity, there's law of non-contradiction, maybe um, excluded middle. And these um, are material entities on his view, but different of different gender, a different type of gender, right? Victor, yeah. And and then so we then then the what one of the ways that you responded to Victor was you said that well couldn't there be another being with very different um different laws of of logic? And when I'm when I'm pointing out the problem with that is that when you say could there be, there that could couldness possibility is parasitic on the very laws that are in question. Right. And so and, and, and most importantly and most importantly, it doesn't really uh, address the, the point that was made, which is just the existence of different morphologies within the within matter. And this, okay, is important. It's relevant to the question that we were talking at hand of a uh, free will, because by means of accepting this materialism, we already rule out the existence of free will in the sense of being caused by an uncaused Spirit, living spiritual entity, which is in a sense another substance, that uh, is the one that directs our actions, the one that that uh, may that puts them into action. Okay. And, yeah, and this is the, the the question. So this is this is really going back to the topic of free will. Does anyone propose the existence of this uh, substance that is a living spiritual substance or living spiritual substances in general? Mm -hmm that are the ones that are behind uh, human action, human activities? You see, but substance has so much, um, I guess, historical weight in philosophy. I, I mean, I, I don't think that the Cartesian sense of substance or the Racilian sense of substance, I don't accept any of that, but I think that there are non-physical states, non-physical entities, um, and namely stuff like uh, mental states, but I think you're invoking precisely that distinction, uh, like on, on specifically Descartian ground, Cartesian grounds with Descartes. Yeah, but Cartesian Descartes grounds. is specific. Th those are just genders of different genders of matter. Th those are be they belong in a sense uh, to the same group of things, but they are discreetly different to them. Yeah, I, I, if you what you mean by matter is something like that which exists, or you know, I don't know exactly what you mean by matter. So we may not be disagreeing. Um, but what most go ahead. Okay, so normally the, the distinction here was made, uh, and, and I said it at the beginning, between the uh, spiritual, in, in the classical debate of the materialists, okay, and the, and the spiritualists in this sense, was that the materialists denied the existence of spiritual substances. And by yeah, that, by substance. that negation, by that negation, by that, by that negation, what they say is that everything that is material is everything that is not spiritual. And existence is materiality, Therefore, everything that exists is material. Here, let, let me intervene quickly. Yeah, um, I, I think I think 
where Victor is operating from is that substances by definition are different. What is part Worlds. of one sub? Well, well, well sort different. of, yeah. It's the things that can stand in causal relationships with each other are of one substance. Um, when we're talking about multiple substances, we're saying that in some sense there's a break there. That's okay, that's sort of like the whole utility meant, of, of spirit. That's fine. I'm just saying that, like, I'm not a substance dualist because substance theory implies something called bare particulars and many and, and a lot of these uh, metaphysical conversations they imply bare particulars i don't i i reject bare particulars but if we're just using substance and that the way that uh sunday just described i'm fine i'm just saying that um with respect to what you just said victor if you're just defining the material as that which exists and the spiritual as that which doesn't exist then everyone's a materialist because no one believes in things that don't no one thinks that they believe in no one uh, affirms that they believe in things that don't exist, right? No, like, that is not. That is not. That is not. That is not. Okay, the thing. That, what, that, that, that is what, the this is what I was talking about. Then the uh, certain naive versions of materialism. I mean, my version of materialism. What I was saying is that it denies the existence of living spiritual things. What now, is a spiritual think, thing? You need to answer that question. What is a spiritual thing? Okay, and I and I said it. It's a thing that, or in this sense, a substance that is disembodied and that is living, okay, that has a life. Okay, it. disembodied, right? So exactly, it is. But not everything that is disembodied is a spiritual, because what I was saying is that there are disembodied things which belong to the material, and this is why I was talking about the different morphologies of 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 uh, of material. And so in this sense, what I was describing was the fact that uh, mental states are material, but they belong to a different gender of mate of material. Uh, uh, things. Okay. Let's use real, uh, Christianity to understand what you're saying. So mm -hmm. God is this disembodied mind, exactly. but he comes either he he becomes incarnate. God is a spiritual substance, in right? This but sense. when he when he becomes incarnate under Christianity, when he becomes Jesus, let's just grant the truth of Christianity for the sake of argument. Mm -hmm. Is that no longer is his mind is Jesus's mind no suddenly become material? Is that the view because it's embodied? In this in this sense, uh, the, I mean, the, it depends on obviously on on how you uh, talk about the Jesus. Some some people say, okay, Jesus is simply God's son in the sense of uh, he is distinct from God. Some people talk about Jesus as if Jesus was God himself. So if God, okay, comes into the material world in this sense, and uh, Jesus was. A God in the in 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 this scenario that you were presenting, in this case, I would say that uh, there is a, certainly a materiality in Jesus's body, and in Jesus's uh, mental states, and in and in uh, okay. all of those. Genders. But nevertheless, the there is there is an the, people appeal here, okay, to a thing which is a disembodied spiritual living spiritual substance, which in this sense is God. So they would say, okay, is God that is behind the actions of Jesus, for example, okay, because Jesus is a uh, God in this scenario. Therefore, the ultimate cause of those things is a spiritual thing that is outside of the realm of the material. Okay, okay, so uh, let me make it, so you have a disembodied mind, it, mm -hmm. he then becomes embodied, right, so he has this mind, now a body, so it went from God to mind. No, I mean, it, 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 in a sense, I, I don't know how people want to see it, but it could say that it embodies a in a sense, a certain part of its mind. But in, we, since we're talking about this, and, and to me this makes little sense, uh, I don't care how you really look at it, okay? The thing is, if God is still outside, okay, of the natural, but he just produced a human being and said, okay, yeah. this is my son, and then he directs everything that this human being does, and in a sense, this human being is a, a puppet, Okay, directed by God. Yeah, but that's from, not the scenario. From... Okay, wait, but Danny, you're you're kind of already presupposing the negation of Victor's point because Victor is saying like it's in principle, it's in principle, it's impossible for a uh, mind to exist to or exist exactly. This is what I was saying. This and is what you already is a logical. Are you saying there's a logical contradiction with that? No, what I'm saying is that we deny the 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 existence of these things. Of course, there is a logical yeah. contradiction within my with, exactly. This is, so this is why I was saying, like when I was talking about your example, it, to me it doesn't make sense. Like I can entertain it, but to me it doesn't make sense because I deny it. What do you mean by it doesn't make sense if you can entertain it? 
Danny, I don't think he's that it doesn't um, that it doesn't align with the with the framework that I'm working with. That it's right, I'm but that's but I'm trying to understand the framework here because you're trying to paint this spiritual yes. spirituality and this material reality, right? And then the way that you contrast, but, but I don't think that it exists. Is the spiritual reality? I don't think it, it could exists. Exist, but, but people appeal to it. People appeal to some to some spiritual things. So my uh, uh, philosophical tradition. What is is a negation of that other philosophical tradition that admits the existence of those substances. Maybe I'll just give you my view because I'm not really understanding your view, right? So I'll give you my view and then you tell me. But basically, I think that minds aren't immaterial. They're non-physical, okay? Whether they're embodied or not, if God had a mind and then he had no body, that mind is immaterial. If God chose to have a body and to become human, there would be God's mind plus a body, the mind is both immaterial, whether it's embodied or disembodied. That's my view. But the way that you're characterizing is that part of a, a hallmark of being a spiritual thing is that it's disembodied. And that's just weird for me because if God became a human, right, you're committed to thinking that God's mind is material. Okay, I understand. I understand. Okay, okay I understand where the where the confusion lies. I'm, I'm not objecting in principle, okay, to everything that is a spiritual being disembodied, okay? I'm not talking about it in principle. I'm talking about it in this general sense of what people generally propose as being spiritual, okay? Normally, they talk about disembodied minds. They talk about disembodied substances. And why I was saying that it, it, normally what I define it as is a disembodied living thing. But of course, in, in this sense, I, I agree with you, okay, that you can come up with examples where this wouldn't be uh, true, okay, where you could have in a sense, um, 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 a spiritual substance that is embodied, that has a kind of body to it. Okay? Uh, but but to me, that is going a little bit more to the limit, you know, because to, to me, this is really not important. I haven't uh, really given a much, um, entertained that idea that much, but because I don't think it, it really has any any importance, any relevance to the main point that I was making, which is basically that, will. There are, that everything, that my materialism is not a corporate Okay, it's not a naive materialism because I, I um, accept the existence of things which are disembodied but nevertheless are material. Yeah, look, I think under and, your sense of material, and, I, and I think I, that we I, agree in a sense. We agree. Yeah, no, I, I don't think there's a substantive disagreement here. Yes. Um, I think I could accept your sense of materialism. I'd be a material, probably a materialist. Exactly. We're, we're just like probably getting a, a little bit lost here. Uh, the disagreement was a little bit more on the on the labels part than on the concept. That's trying to clear part. up. Yeah, but I, I think I understand what you're saying. I, I, I think that like you almost want to take a, the way that Nietzsche understood like the, uh, the non-natural world was like something that's completely disconnected from life circumstances, uh, your bodily dispositions and your... Um, all of that, right? The, the idea of God and the platonic forms and all that is so out there. It's like completely other. It doesn't really have to do with this world. But you're saying that your materialism is, uh, you're, when you affirm you're a materialist, you're talking about things in this world that interact with the world in a kind of a, almost like a political, that which can engage in a materialistic um, perspective in a political, in the political sense, right? Like, I think that's kind of how I'm understanding you. And I, I think, yeah, I will. I might accept platonic forms or platonic objects, abstract objects, but that's an, that's another dispute, probably. In 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 my in my uh, in my uh, uh, distinction of the different genders of matter, okay, I distinguish mainly between three genders of matter, okay, um, and and the first one encompasses, okay, uh, what generally uh, materialists have thought materialism should encompass okay which is first of all the purely material physical objects and things like um, uh, fields you know all of these things that are not necessarily things that you can that you can grab things that you can touch but they nevertheless exist okay magnetic fields all of those things now there is a second gender okay and the second gender uh, relates to the describes the set of things which belong to mental states okay mental states uh, the feeling of pain, for example, okay, that would be uh, uh, that would be within this second morphology, and it is discreetly different, different from the first, and it's discreetly different from the first, uh, from the first gender, and then there is another gender, and this is the third gender, okay, which this is sounds like something M3. like you're not a dual aspect theorist or anything like that. No, what? what so l l let me first uh, describe the the third thing, 
Okay, the M3, okay, we described the first two things that I described were M1 and M2. Now, M3 is um, ideas and the relations between them, but they are not necessarily mental states. Okay, we're talking, for example, about geometrical forms. Okay, those things are ideas and those things belong to a third gender of matter. And that third gender is also discreetly different from mental states and from the first, uh, from M1 that I described. So you think that like ideas like geometric forms, they exist mind independently. Okay, I, I, I wouldn't say uh, in this sense that they are mind independent, okay, because my morpho the, the, the different morphologies that I'm talking about here, I'm not talking about dependence, okay, I'm talking about a categorical distinction between them, okay? You call, something could be dependent on something else and still be discreetly different from it, okay? The life of my cat, for example, it, it can be, I mean, my cat can, can live perfectly well outside, but there are some pets that cannot live in the in the wilderness, that cannot live without their, uh, without the people that feed them and that give them shelter and all of that, okay? That life is independent from mine. Sorry, it, it depends on mine. But it is nevertheless independent in the categorical sense that it is a different life. But yeah, nevertheless, so it depends. It depends. Okay. The no, existence when I, when of I say life like depends. mind independent, I mean that like it, they exist if, outside. Uh, so yes. I am not convinced. Okay. I'm, I am not convinced of the uh, of the exi of the possible existence of geometrical forms outside of our minds. But I can nevertheless think. Okay. In, I can do a mental exercise of other species that are not human species, developing geometrical forms. So I would say that, although I'm not convinced that this could be the case, I can think of it being the case. Okay, I can think of it being the case. I can think of geometrical forms being human mind independent. Now, I don't know about mind in, in general independent because I don't think that the only minds that exist are human minds. But I think that it is certainly, and, and this is something that I, that I do defend because I can think about it pretty pretty vividly, that geometrical forms are human mind independent. Okay. You know, I can imagine, for example, a, another a species of apes becoming sufficiently intelligent enough to a, discover and to a, understand the laws of logic and and, 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 and certain mathematical uh, purely formal objects like uh, geometrical forms and and that and those uh, kind of things so what do you mean by understand by understand it means that to have the concept of and to uh, have a working definition of you know when we talk about a square for example we understand the square because we know what we we have a definition of the square and we know the properties of the square and we uh, have an understanding of that that square is you know that's what understanding means so you don't think that like other animals have the ability to conceptualize squares? For I example. think I think they do. I think they I think they but do. Right now, think, right now. Yeah, I mean right now. Um, right now in in on Earth, I am unconvinced of the existence of a different uh, animal that is able to uh, understand these things. But nevertheless, I think that. Uh, the, that at some point in time it could happen. Maybe at some point in the past that we don't know of, these uh, animals existed. And maybe in another part of the universe there are aliens that in fact have a working definition of these uh, objects, of these geometrical objects. So I certainly, and this is why I was saying that I think that these objects are human mind independent. But that, that, that is not a problem for my materialism because my materialism is not proposing a dependence theory. It's not, it's not a theory about what depends on what. It's a, it's a theory about, it's an ontological theory, first of all, about everything that exists. And it proposes different uh, genders of matter, but it proposes ultimately that everything that exists is material. Can I, can I ask a question here just to kind of get at something? <clears throat> If you have the abstract geometric idea of a sphere in your mind, where literally what you're thinking of is the equation of like, um, what's it, like four pi over three or squared, something like that, and a star, which literally is the most perfect representation of a sphere found in nature, are they the same thing or which is an imitation of the other? Well, in, in this sense, um... I, I wouldn't say that they're the same thing, first of all. I wouldn't say that they're the same thing. Uh, and 
I mean, what goes first, the chicken or the egg, you know? I, I think that what goes first is the egg. So in this sense, I think that what goes first are the objects and then our ideas about the objects are the things that come second. But in this sense, um, you know, maybe somebody could come up with an argument to say, no, the, the, the ideal form comes first. But but I, I am unconvinced of that proposition. I think that first come the objects and then come our theory uh, or, or ideas about them. Yeah, because where where my thinking breaks down a bit sometimes is because <clears throat> um, just through astrophysics, through looking at just the shapes that celestial bodies just seem to take on, <clears throat> um, simplicity basically is the argument being made. Um, massive bodies take on the most stable shape they can possibly take, which is typically its simplest shape. Um, it's why you don't find square planets. And it's to a degree why above like certain asteroid levels, you won't find um, lumpy planets, you'll find oblate planets. And it's just simply got to do with the way matter relates to itself. And it just forms stable objects. At some level, there's a part of me that I don't know how to square the circle in here. But nature is attracted to certain ways of constructing itself. And we are aware of that relationship. Somebody one day sat down and thought to themselves, a point is the most simplest geometric shape. And then if I connect two points, I get a line and then so on and so forth. Where like to me, the laws of logic are just being aware that you can reproduce a pattern. That's that's all they are to me. And then you introduce things like um, contradiction where uh, a contradiction is when that repetition breaks down. Um, I don't know how to arrive at a position where the universe exists if geometric shapes exist in our heads first because the universe is way older than us. That's, that's kind of where I get at. Um, I, I, you can call it vulgar materialism if you want. At some level, I think everything is related to physical processes uh, to some degree. But I get annoyed when people might try to argue that it's a reductive view because I'm trying to incorporate the idea of complexity because an atom and a subatomic particle share pretty much no physical processes, but you can reduce an atom to a fundamental particle and they will interact with matter completely differently. Um, just energy in the form of a wave and the mind, in my mind, they fundamentally link together. They just operate in completely different ways because one is just at a different strata for whatever reason when they put it. But I don't think there's like one's higher than the other. Okay. They're just, they're at different layers. That's the okay, way I think about Zanzi, it. Okay, but Zanzi, so the different, I think, I guess the problem is, though, is that I don't think that subatomic particles and atomic particles, or atoms, rather, um, they don't behave in ways that are, like, mutually contradictory, right? Like, we can explain the behavior of atoms in terms of sub subatomic particles, but I don't think that the same is true of minds. I think well, that... The, no, the, using quantum mechanics, the best thing we understand is... Um, atomic particles, they just, they collapse the waveform because they only have like, they have binary energy states. Whereas things at a quantum level, um, they have like infinite potential states. So the only fundamental difference is one collapses into an observable event, the other doesn't. That's that's the difference. Okay. Like I, I, we, we know where a molecule is simply because there is so much energy that it collapses into it being here. But Whereas uh, where an electron is, we've no fucking clue because it doesn't collapse that easily. Being a reductionist, though, is sort of, you know, um, you can reduce phenomena into a more complex um, framework, right? So, like, you might say, you know, this leaf, which I take to be a simple thing, right, reduces to all of this chemical stuff. And the chemical stuff can be a lot more complex than the leaf, right? So what makes you a reductionist has to do with integrating higher order stuff with lower order stuff, but doesn't really have to do with complexity. I don't think. Yeah. I, I'm just more expressing that I get annoyed when I'm called a reductionist. For you, it seems like you are, though. Yeah. There's nothing wrong uh, with I mean, no, no, I, 
I don't know. Just like, e explain to me because I don't, I don't get it. Well, what a reduction is. No, 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 no. How I'm being reductionist. Because what I understand a reduction to be is you're taking higher order phenomena, right? And you're integrating it into a lower, more fundamental set of phenomena. Otherwise, I don't know what really you're talking about when you're saying that you reduce X to Y or whatever. Uh, okay, I get what you mean. Um, I guess it's the colloquial term of how reductionist is used. Yeah, like people tell you're being too redu reductionistic. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I think I'm. I think I'm referring to just a phrase that exists among people and communities. Mm -hmm. um, left wing people are accused of being reductionist all the goddamn time, and it basically just means you're ignoring complexity. Well, it's used um, in that okay. context almost synonymously with essentialistic, right? Yeah. Essentialistic. When, when when what I'm trying to say is, you can you the, the the simple can give rise to the complex, and you're not a reductionist for noticing that. That's what I'm getting at. Yeah, but this complex can also give rise to the simple. Oh, yeah. Like. Yeah, so I, I see what you mean now. I mean, I think yeah. you're in a lot of political circles, and so reduct, being a reductionist or reductionistic is, has like a negative connotation, right? Yeah, it's so frustrating. Like I said, like, uh, actually, I haven't said it yet today. I was involved in physics. Reductionism is just a key part of how STEM works. So you try to boil complexity down to simplicity. It's the whole system. So, so Sansi, you are a physicalist, right? I, it's the term that I hear being applied, and I think it's the one that I resonate most with. I could never say what I am because I don't think I'm aware enough of the different philosophies to nail my colors to any flag. But physicalism is, I think, the best term for how I you think. think you can, like, discover what your beliefs are in some kind of fin fundamental sense? Like, you... like via scientific inquiry you can come to know what the nature of the mind is i i think at some level we have to just take a leap and kind of make an assumption about where we go from there and and at some level i just i have to say i don't know how to get from reality to the mind so to bridge that gap i just say the mind comes from reality that's I, I bridge that gap by reality, you mean like physical reality, because uh, yeah, just like the physical world as we interact with it. Well, Zanzi, I have a question. Um, yep. I'd assume like all of us, we believe in like some supervenience relationship, right? So like I don't know what that the, is. Yeah, so the whole like if we say that like the mind is just um, you know a collection of all of the um, you know parts of our brain or whatever that are used to think, then um, in order for the mind to change, it's necessary that all the parts in the brain, like the specific neurons firing, have to change, right? Um, we're not like, no one hears a substance dualist, I'm guessing. So um, I feel like, the, the I, I think I know like what you're trying to get at, because intuitively, that's obviously true. But at the same time, it's going to be the case that um, that's not what like these different philosophical schools are talking about. And so like, I kind of get your frustration as someone who's like a lay person, like talking about this issue. King Crocoduck, I see you have been angered enough by the uh, the proceeding to abandon your filial duties. How are you? I'm well. How are you? Good, thank you. Uh, sorry about the mic quality. I'm not set up in my studio. It sounds very good. Uh, what's the what's the contention from Mr. Crocoduck? Um, I'm not sure yet. <laughs> I, I I I heard a little bit of the conversation. Heard some talk of physics and uh, the mind, and I'm like, "Wow, this is my wheelhouse. Let's let, uh, let me in." Okay. So right now we're talking about physicalism, materialism, dualism. Uh, do you just want to give us a rundown on your general uh, position on that? Uh, sure. Yeah. So I would align myself with people who call themselves physicalists and materialists. Um, although they're going to mean different things depending on who you talk to. Um, but, you know, I, I, I like to, more recently, I like to take a kind of ruthlessly pragmatic approach to um, some of the consequences that follow from these positions, things like, um, you know, uh, personal accountability and personal freedom <clears throat> in a world where supposedly, you know, uh, it's, it's deterministic and therefore you supposedly have no free will. And, you know, practically speaking, um, when, when I'm confronted by this kind of contention, usually in the context of like religious and spiritual debates, 
uh, somebody coming up to me and saying, "Hey, you know, uh, if if we're all if we're just chemicals fizzing in in, in people's brains, um, then you know, what 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 is morality? What is justice? What is good? What is you know how how do, how do we hold anybody accountable?" And <clears throat> my kind of answer to this kind of attitude is. Um, it doesn't make any practical difference whether we're chemicals fizzing in a brain um, or ghosts inside of a machine. Um, it doesn't change my competency to, uh, you know, to, to pay my bills, to sign a contract, um, to rent a car. Uh, it, 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 it makes practically no difference. Um, so that's, that's how I answer that kind of contention. I pretty and much agree the, with that. Yeah. Sorry? Sorry, I was just saying I pretty much agree with that. That's all. I mean, but you can have false beliefs and not make a difference. Like if someone asked me what the square root of 935 was and I said two, and that's not going to make a practical difference in my life, but I'm still wrong. Oh, yeah, it depends, also that's like an but... extreme dichotomy, you know, like only like chemicals fizzing in the brain versus, you know, a ghost in a machine. Those are like the two extremes. You know? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm simplifying this, the, the discourse just to give you like a 10 second elevator pitch of, of how these conversations go. Um, yeah. But yeah, in, in, for for the square root of of negative one hundred and two, um, I think it will make a difference um, if you know you're you're an airplane engineer. Yeah, but I'm not. So I I don't I think I'll ever need to know the square root of like three hundred and forty five billion, right? I don't. Sorry, I don't I don't need that, right? No, so because I'm wrong, wrong if I say it's two. Arriving at the wrong answer for the wrong reason is pretty important because it has implications for the way you reason about other things. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's... Uh, not just that, but the, the, there, there is a difference between wrong in the truth sense and wrong in the moral sense, okay? Um, uh, but, 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 but before we get there, uh, I, I wanted to say, in this sense, are we all in agreement here that there uh, is... That, that, uh, are we materialists all here in, in the sense of that we deny the existence of living disembodied. Uh, I'm a materialist object. in your sense, but I'm not a materialist in crocodile sense. I mean, I'm yeah. not a materialist in either sense, but um, yeah. any like quote unquote proof of that is just going to be appeal to speculation. It's not going to be, I can't give you like good reasons to believe what I believe. You know? I think Danny's so, so, so position you, is the you, one you, I align with most here. So uh, Max, Max here believes in the existence of a disembodied living substance? Well, no, I'm not like a Cartesian dualist. Um, I would say that like, what is it? I would just say like I'm a hylomorphic panpsychist with um, uh, sort of theological speculations. That's what I would say. Wait, so Max, are you a theist? Yeah, this was pretty clear. Yeah, like the last yeah. time we had a debate. Yeah, so I, I, that's what I'm saying. It's like I'm pretty sure Max. Of is course, a Max is a theist. Yeah. We've got an anime profile. Keep going. <laughs> yeah, so I'm pretty sure that like Max is going to be the most radically different from us, and that Max probably rejects your entire premise, Victor, which is that there are no disembodied minds. Yeah, but I don't really want to debate that, and my view can like I can just sort of like um, what is it section off parts of my view to make it more uh, you know materialist in Victor's sense. So. Okay. Well, this might come as a surprise to some of you, but um, my ontology could actually accommodate things like spiritual substances. Um, it would just have to be absorbed into a naturalistic framework. Um, so the way that I conceive of this kind of the the way I conceive of this kind of thing is you could have different categories. You you can have multiple ontologies. You can have the natural. You can have the supernatural. You can have the super duper natural. The super duper duper natural, quasi natural, para natural. However many hyphenated naturals you want, and um, basically, the, the the demarcation between them um, would be the the types of methodologies applied, or, or the families of methodologies applied. <clears throat> so, I mean, the most know, common uh, definition of physicalism or materialism in analytic philosophy is something like everything is physical or necessitated by the physical. So, if you're if you're leaving room for God. Right, and you're, but think that God is going to be integrated in some kind of physicalistic, naturalistic framework. Then, under the definition I just gave, right, um, you know, every you're going to be physicalist, right? Yeah, I, I kind of don't. I'm, I'm not a huge fan of the old definition, though, because it, there, there's there's a problem of circularity that I find it can sometimes lead to if Sorry. you 
define from the outset everything as being natural or, or everything as, as being physical, um, then you know you're you're kind of constraining the scope of of what's allowed to exist in your ontology. That's why the second also, the second part of that is very important. It's not that everything is is physical, right? That yeah, it's everything is physical or necessitated by the physical. But it also depends on on how on on what you think physical is because uh, a part of my ontology and I am a materialist and I was saying is that I believe that there are different genders of matter and there are genders of matter which do not require corporeism which do not require things to be embodied okay so there can be material things that are in that are uh, disembodied and this is what I was saying do you identify that which is physical with that which has a body. Well, Are you asking yeah, me? Very, oh. I'm asking King King Kokuro, yeah. Um, so I, I I'm coming at this as as kind of a weirdo because uh, I'm I'm one of those people who places methodology prior to ontology. So when when I say something is natural or something is physical, what I mean is that the methodologies that we apply to understand the world are capable of capturing um capturing those phenomena. They're, they we're able to situate those phenomena within our representations of the world, um, which we build using particular methodologies. And so, so what you mean then is that it can be physically described, right? Uh, no, yes, I think with an asterisk. Yeah, this, okay. This, okay, correct me if I'm wrong. Isn't this uh, Chomsky's approach to this question of? Um, physical just means anything we can in principle apply our um, understanding to like something that we can understand or do understand is what we consider to be physical I don't know about Chomsky's but another common one is that which can be approached by the natural sciences or studied by the natural sciences mm -hmm. but yeah that um, sounds like an important qualifier I don't know what Chomsky's is though um, I think like, I like Rock it's Rock earlier though right was like hinting more at like Imagine you thought God was like Tertullian's God. So I'm getting this out of his book. Um, what is it? Against Hermogenes, right? Tertullian defines God as like an element. He's just like a, like imagine the universe. He defines God as like um, the collection of all the elements which had no beginning, like the type of element which had no divinity, uh, no, no beginning. And he calls that element divinity, right? And he says that's God, right? So if like, we found out like in the beginning of the universe, there was like an extra element and it was just like this omnipotent element or something. Then it's like in like in principle, it could be possible that that could exist, right? Probably doesn't exist, but um, like that would be accommodated in uh, Crocodux ontology, I guess. Yeah. Let me maybe clarify the sort of how I approach this issue um, using kind of a crazy example. So let's say uh, I go to Greece and I climb to the top of Mount Olympus and I find that I'm able to interact with the pantheon of ancient Greek gods, right? And their existence is as evident to me as gravity or any one of you. Yeah. Um, and my conventional approach to understanding the world, my, uh, my, my development of representations of the world that adhere to certain criteria, um, and then which, you know, allows me to, to distinguish between things that I'm willing to call, you know, true or good representations of the world versus, versus crap representations of the world. That, that no longer works in this situation um, because the phenomena that I'm dealing with are so queer and so fundamentally different from everything else that has been placed into my ontology that, that it's just no longer applicable. Um, that, would, uh, th that would necessitate, um, presumably, a new... Uh, set of methodological norms um, in order to be able to understand this phenomenon, in order to be able to, to understand this, this, these ancient Greek pantheon um, in the event that, you know, the, the current set of tools that I use to appraise the rest of the world um, is, is, is inapplicable to that situation. And so in that case, I create a new ontological category and, you know, I'll put, I'll put them into the super duper natural, for example. And I can do this with as, as many um, different type of phenomena as, as, as I please. Um, wherever, um, you know, kind of the, the, the methodology that I, that I champion um, is inapplicable uh, in understanding a phenomenon, um, a new set have to be crafted and kind of partitioned into, into its own separate ontological category, if that makes sense. Okay. Uh, just very quickly, we've lost uh, Danny. He had to go. Um, check out Phil Talk, P-H-I-L Talk on YouTube to see more of him.
sorry, because you were people. I, I just wanted to say uh, one thing. So then in this sense, okay, in, in the in, in, in the sense of that we were discussing at first of uh, free free will, then uh, since we seem to all be in agreement, uh, maybe Max not, but he 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 said that he more or less can fit that somewhere in his uh, belief system. But since we all are in agreement of the proposition, okay, that uh, there is no such thing as a as a disembodied spiritual substance. Uh, in in this sense, can we then say that uh, human beings, okay, they act and they act according to certain things which are material, that all the, 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 the leading factors, the factors that lead to a human action and the human action itself are all material. Are we in agreement yep. with that? I, I, think, I think what frustrates me is I feel like I agree, but I still have no idea what you mean by disembodied spiritual thing, which 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 pulls me to the, the position I had in the, the last channel of Ignosticism where I think there are some things that are just fundamentally unable to kind of like get across a subjective barrier where we, I'll never know that I actually understand what you mean. So I, I have no way of knowing that we're even talking about the same thing here. Can so I, when I say I agree with you, I don't even know if we're at the same point, the, the, but we can come yes. to the same outcomes. I think that's what I'm getting at, but it frustrates me a bit. Yeah, the, the thing with spiritual, and, and, and I was defining it at, at uh, and I defined it at the beginning, I said that spiritual in this sense means living, and, and the concept of living is really important, disembodied substance. That is what spiritual yeah. means in my sense. I, and that is what I, my materialism reacts against. Well, not living, I'm, I'm thinking, I just, you, I, you probably I, mean I conscious, right? Yeah, with living, consciousness is probably part of it. Uh, consciousness is, is certainly a part of living, but... Uh, you know, well, living, living is somatic, right? I mean, that's I th exactly. Biology. I think what's perplexing about I have an issue here. What does like viruses I... within biology right now? Are viruses alive? Is it studied? They are alive, exactly. Debated. They are alive, but they well, are it's not. It's a debated conscious. question. No, it's a debated question because yeah. okay, yes, I know okay. it's a debated question. Uh, hang, hang, on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Le leaving all that aside, though, I think what's sort of perplexing about that language, Victor, is that when we think of life, we tend to think of something that is ultimately understood in terms of relationships that are physical. So when you're talking about a living, we're talking about a living I, substance. That just sounds I, I would, like physical. Let, let's just go. Let's just go with the with with uh, conscious because conscious in in this sense probably best approximates the the notion of living uh, that that I'm working with. Okay, so let, let's go with conscious. There is a conscious, disembodied substance. Yeah, that is the spiritual. So I I think I would I agree with you, and I would agree even if there were conscious disembodied substances because i don't think that i don't think that free will in the libertarian sense is even a coherent idea so i don't think that it's possible for it to exist in any ontology like that i, I no, because if we agree on the ontological part this is really good because now we can discuss free will uh, having established a really important part of the debate because generally this debate is framed from the from the framework of the debate between materialism and, and, and idealism and, and some kind of spiritualism. I, yeah, So, uh, but what I'm saying is that I actually don't think it matters if you're an idealist, a dualist, a materialist, whatever. I think that in any framework, free will is a totally incoherent concept unless you define it very hmm. specifically. And libertarian okay. free will sure. is not that. Yeah. I agree. For sure, for sure. Victor, just, to, just, to, but just to reverse engineer what you're saying to see if we come to the same position. Because if we do, then I agree with you. It's like, for whatever phrase that we'll use to kind of communicate the idea that we have for like whether it's disembodied uh, spiritual or it's consciousness if we had the ability to like dissect it down to first principles it we would find those first principles in the physical world somewhere well no it's not even that it's just that like as an idea it's it doesn't line up with what we actually understand free will to be so like the 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 simplest way I can. Oh, I haven't gotten to free will yet. Oh, uh, I, I'm just thinking about. Um, I, I, I'm I'm trying to kind of like come at Victor's argument, but going down the ladder instead of going up it, just to see if we're we're, we're see if we're kind of like in the same ballpark. Oh, sorry. Um, this is the 100 page preface to the 600 volume treatise. <laughs> my, my 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 educational backgrounds in physics. What a word means. I I'll spend six pages arguing my terms. <laughs> 
Um, sure. it, it just it, at, at our fundamental first pref, uh, principles, we can find them in the physical world somewhere. Is that a question for Victor? It's a question, yeah. But is it for him or for me? I don't know, for yourself. Um, for, like when you say consciousness, if we mm -hmm. were able to like break it down to first principles, I'm not saying we're able to, but just, just say we were, would we find that first principles rooted in the physical world somewhere? Depending on what you the, on, on what you mean by first principles, but I mean that's part of what um, that is part of what I, what I was saying. That spiritual means that it cannot be found in the in the physical realm. So even think, if you were to break it down, even if you were to break it down in some sense, uh, this thing would still be spiritual. Would still be disembodied. Uh, I mean, maybe the, the the parts of it wouldn't be conscious, but certainly the whole of it would be conscious. And yeah. In this sense, th it is immaterial. Yeah, well, I think what Victor, is not ir irreconcilable. Yeah. Wants to say. If I'm if I'm understanding Victor correctly, I think what he's saying, um, or or an equivalent to what he's saying, is that if the universe ceased to exist, um, then the spiritual substances that he's that he's talking about uh, would still continue to exist. They're not contingent upon upon the universe as, as we understand exactly it. exactly yeah if they uh, were I, to exist but i deny that they exist right yeah. right i get you i'm, I'm just, like I'm just saying, clarifying how you sure, talk about this right. i I, sure. I think at some point you get to a point where you have to just make an assumption it, it feels like the assumption here is being placed towards if the universe didn't exist spirit would exist i'm just going the other way and my assumption is it wouldn't um, so we disagree, but I don't think it's a material disagreement. It yeah, won't no, stop sure. us from talking. Material as in, sure. when you say material, do you mean it's not a relevant disagreement? If the or universe ceases to exist, I don't think it makes sense to say something exists. Well, yeah. it seems so, like even no, no. even when even Sorry. when we're talking, yeah, be quiet. Seriously, no, you can't. <laughs> um, even even when we're talking about like other substances, we seem to be talking about them as things that are strictly parasitic on the physical, like it's kind of film that lays over it. So even when we're talking about like uh, the, the bare fact that we're even talking about, when we talk about like the, the disappearance of the universe, it really means the disappearance of the physical universe with this other thing that really only makes sense to even invoke as a consequence of the physical universe. Would we invoke it in its absence? No, obviously not. That's kind of, yeah. Sorry, serious. go on, what were you gonna say? No, I. Never mind. It's not important. <laughs> I know. I'm oh. just but like I'm trying to be no, kind. No, no. I, I, it was because that he because Zanzi said it's not what his words were. It's not a material disagreement, and I was trying to understand if by material, yeah, it's semantic, yeah, yeah, <laughs> like, disagreement I, is material I'm, by yeah, my definition. Yeah. I, I, normally, it's, I wouldn't. It's get not a up fundamental that. disagreement. Yes, yes, okay. um, like we could still interact. Yeah. Okay, what, I'm just making sure I understood what he meant. <laughs> Let him talk, people. Come on. Okay, go. Serious. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure because, like, we the, since the conversation is about materialism, I wanted to make sure that, like, I actually understood what he was saying. That's all. Anyway, so so what I wanted to say now is, okay, having having more or less established uh, this initial point, I would like to go to the to the question of what freedom is because then this is the next uh, step toward addressing the question. I think in general we all agree here with uh, the non-existence of free will, but. Because free will can mean different things, we can maybe start now with uh, freedom. And in this sense, uh, I, I can remind you of what I in initially thought uh, said that I think freedom is, and then we can start from there. So the, well, the thing that I said, that, uh, oh, yeah, you can, I you can just go. Very quickly, I'm, I'm not sure that I disagree with the notion that free will exists. I just think it's typically talked about in a way that's sort of inappropriate to the kinds of things that we are. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, talk I, about, I, yeah, so like, we, we typically, we typically, so. no, no, but we, we forget that like we typically talk about like just just the notion of willing by itself is is intimately connected with the notion of freedom we identify something as being free when it does what it's willing to do the notion of free will is sort of redundant what we're actually talking about is just the fact that a will is unconstrained full stop when people start talking about libertarian free will it seems like they want the will somehow to transcend its own willingness and and be like it it becomes incoherent as a concept that's why it kind of falls apart but the notion of freedom as such isn't actually obviated by that fact. It just means it's something that's situated at a certain, I don't know, level of existence or whatever. Like it, it's, it's the kind of thing that's particular to one. But in this sense, we might know. disagree, you know, maybe in, in these senses, we may disagree uh, uh, among us here on the definition of freedom, because there are indeed people, for example, that uh, are in the Austrian school of economics tradition who would 
say, okay, I think I, I believe in determinism. I don't think that, uh, in a sense, the 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 human actions are determined by an unconstrained will that that itself is uncaused and it belongs to a different uh, strata of existence and whatever. So there would there are indeed many ocean economists, uh, people working within that tradition that would say, okay, I think that my belief, my notion of freedom is not dependent on the existence of determinism. So this is why I think we should talk about what uh, freedom is because I have serious disagreements with people who are ontologically close to where I am but nevertheless have a completely different understanding of freedom and ascribe to uh, this freedom concept that they have moral value and this is important also for the question of moral responsibility okay. so, yeah so, so so on that point I, I actually take a fairly radical position uh, which is that any talk of freedom within the context of morality is misleading and, and looking at the issue from the wrong end of the telescope I think that fundamentally what we're talking about is accountability and uh, the conditions under which it's appropriate to um, in, enforce rules, basically. Um, and this, this talk of freedom, it, it kind of leads us into metaphysical spirals and, and, and I, I don't think these con those kinds of conversations are, are terribly productive because at the end of the day, when we talk about morality and, 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 and responsibility, we're, we're talking about the um, practical application of enforcement of consequences. Um, so there was a famous case in, not too long ago, it was, it was only a few years ago, of a guy who, um, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get you demonetized Sunday, I'm sorry. Uh, I would just make it abstract. Okay, he did something very bad to children. Uh, he had no history. Oh God. Cro Cro King Crocodile, you obviously haven't been paying attention to what my channel's been... <clears throat> dealing with recently no i think we're safe okay <laughs> yes you were all right okay so he, he he started molesting children and um he had no history of this he 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 was um described by by everybody who knew him as a good guy who never did anything like that. and it turned out that he had a brain tumor um that nobody knew about um but but apparently he had a brain tumor he wasn't aware of and it was growing in the region of the brain that was responsible for um, uh, for for regulating um, so, something to do with 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 um, sex risk. Drive. Uh, sorry, sex drive. Um, I, I don't know about sex drive. I think it had something to do with with modulating um, risk taking behavior and then some some set of activity. Re regardless, it was it was it was determined that um, you know he was he was not guilty, even though he did do the thing, and you know he was conscious and he was aware of it. The 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 circumstances that led him to do the thing. Um, made it so that it, it didn't make sense uh, to convict him. And I think the reason it didn't make sense to convict him is because the reason why we convict, the reason why we hold people accountable um, for certain actions, uh, well, there are several reasons there. Uh, we, we want uh, restitution for the victims or, or, re or we want, um, what should we call it? Uh, re restitution is one, one possible reason. Another possible reason is um, we want to deter um, future incidents of crime, right? We, we, we want to keep people from committing. So, you know, there's a sign on the road says, uh, don't go in the carpool lane. Um, if you, if you don't have, you know, somebody with you, otherwise you're going to pay $200, right? That deters people from, from driving in the carpool lane when they're not supposed to. Um, there's, uh, rehabilitation. So, you know, you, you gotta, you gotta go do community service for, for vandalism. You know, so you can understand why what what you're doing isn't good. the 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 point is the 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 fundamental um, responses to to breaches of conduct they they serve practical functions. Mm -hmm. And if we express um, the 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 debate on responsibility and accountability in terms of these uh, in terms of these functions instead of in terms of was the guy free to to molest the kids, or, or was he forced by the tumor to do it, right? Because it, 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 if, 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 you, if you lock people up for, uh, un, under this kind of circumstance, if you lock them up for, um, uh, for, for molesting kids when, when they have, you know, brain cancer, that's kind of, you know, it, it, it doesn't do anything productive. It doesn't stop them um, from doing it again once they get out, if they get out. Um, it doesn't teach them anything. It, it doesn't deter future aggression from people under similar circumstances because you know this this isn't something uh, that that you know that would that would be able to deter them. Um, 
fun- fundamentally, I think if, if, if I'm, 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 I'm waffling. You, you get my point. You're it's not waffling. Terms- no, this it's is totally, something that it we totally find often. There was an ex-professional wrestler where they found the same thing, brain tumor. He murdered, I think it was his wife and his child. Everyone who knew him said that he was totally out of character. Um, I think he killed himself or like he died of a brain hemorrhage or something. But um, yeah, if, if you look for these cases, you can find them everywhere. Of somebody has some sort of brain trauma or brain injury, and then they, they act in some description, exactly like Crocodile is saying. Um, sure. And it gets at what I think is an interesting inversion of the question of rather than describing what free will is, it's let's discuss what we would expect to see in the world. Like, what does free will look like? I think that's a okay. good way of having Ser- uh, Seriously, seriously, yeah. I want to say something. Well, I, I was just going to say, like, I totally agree. I think that when we talk about when people talk about free will, it's almost always in terms of like they have this aversion to to wanting punishment or consequences to be purely instrumental like they think on a some fundamental level that there's like something more to it than that but i i'm perfectly in sync with crocoduck in that i think we should just bite the bullet on that and say that things like consequences and accountability it just serves an instrumental purpose and not like some metaphysically or like uh some other some morally important purpose beyond its instrumental value Exactly. Mm-hmm. That's my. Yeah, I just Go wanted on. to speak to what Crocoduck was saying really quickly. So, hi everyone. Um, I haven't been in on this before. First of all, do I have any weird sound feedback on my end? I'm just kind of worried. No, you sound fine. Perfect. Fine awesome. Cool. Oh, thank God. So, Sunday, is it okay if I if I answer back to what Crocoduck was saying instead of kind of the more general discussion after that? No. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm going to anyway. So basically, um, here's the thing. I don't think that the existence of impulses themselves negates um, free will. And the difficulty with this is that, so first of all, when we look at something like causal determinism, right? Um, the assumption is that you know the future will be roughly conformable to the past, A led to B, B led to C, therefore A led to C. But the difficulty with this kind of framework is that we assume that there's a lot of times that we have determined on sufficiently all of the causal conditions, like we have them all laid out there for us and we've understood them all. Um, And then secondly, we assume that A does in fact lead to B and it's not some other common cause that we're not aware of. So that's the first difficulty with causality. The second difficulty with causality is if you have these sort of causal determinism reasoning is that if you are a determinist, there's no room to respond at any juncture to that causal chain. Like you're sort of, your impulses are forcing you to continue down the causal chain regardless. But we know that people are able to critically respond to that at any point, even if they're not necessarily aware of it. We see people break from past patterns of behavior um, all the time, right? And so what, what happens in the case of somebody whose impulses lead them to bad behavior is it's a very complex situation in which the person based on previous Uh, how do I put it, events, is maybe predisposed in an urgent way to act in a certain way, but they still have the ability on a lot of moral frameworks to say, no, I don't care how compelled I am to do this. I'm not going to do this. Or if I feel so compelled that I can't not do this, I will go and seek outside help. And we know that's also possible. Otherwise, people would be murdering each other left, right, and center if they had the impulse. Or, of- or, or to take, take a more clear-cut example, um, yeah. the idea of resisting torture would be unthinkable. Precisely. And so, and so, what I'm trying to say here is that you know we're not negating the existence of free will by noting that people have strong, even overwhelming impulses. And moreover, causal chains of reasoning we assume that that we assume are complete are not perfect or complete explanations for behavior. So that's just one thing that I wanted so, to kind of push back. So I, yeah. actually, I actually think I agree with that. Be, so okay, but you're to... not Crocoduck, so wait your turn. <laughs> that's Sorry. why you're in prison. You don't follow the rules. Sorry, Crocoduck, then uh, seriously, you reply. Yeah, so um, I, I, I guess my goal wasn't sufficiently clear here. I, I'm trying to sidestep the metaphysical question of of, of, of free will and determinism altogether and trying to look specifically at, at the practical application of, of the reason why anybody's even interested in this topic in the first place and uh, why looking at it in terms of freedom, I think, isn't terribly helpful. Um, so, you know, let, let's, let's suppose for the sake of argument that uh, 
that the, f the libertarian conception of free will was true, right? Um, what changes, practically speaking, in terms of how we carry out uh, uh, criminal justice, for example? If the libertarian example? If, if, if the libertarian conception, conception of freedom is true, if it turned out to be true, what practically changes? And, you know, what, 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 what about the paying attention or do we define that? So here's the thing that I find a little Re really quickly, re re really quickly. Yeah, please. Yeah. Um, just, just, just you, you have two universes, In one universe, the libertarian conception of free will, uh, you know, free will is the, the freedom is the capacity to have chosen otherwise. Right. Uh, where, and, and, you know, you can, you can conceptualize that as ghosts in the machine. Um, and then. In the other universe, you have the ultra-deterministic uh, chemicals fizzing inside of brains. Um, what, is, what is the difference between these two universes in the criminal justice system? Okay, very quickly, just because it's, it's, it's a direct response. Um, I want Jelma, Sirius, and then Max wanted to jump in. Jelma, you're muted. Okay. Um, so, basically... Uh... First of all, I'm looking at this from the perspective of um, being a pragmatist. And so I'm interested in, you know, understanding something via their causal effects in the world. And when you look at the consequences of certain behaviors, ideas, structures, what, even if we're looking at it from a purely pragmatist standpoint, not does free will exist? Does it not exist? Are we, you know, um, tied to these causal chains? What inevitably I think we find instance after instance after instance is that if we believe that people have a choice, we are adhering to principles that reduce suffering, mainly on the basis that we're not going, because there's a lot of dire consequences to the assumption that, for instance, there are certain people whose behavior is going to be causally determined. One of that is you can pick them off of the street before they've ever done anything, which is extremely dangerous, right? Um, Another is that you can assume they're the sort of being who would do certain things in future and you can design institutions around those assumptions that might be completely wrong. So in the instance where we assume there's a minimum of choice available to most people, we aren't predetermining courses of actions that realistically we can't because outside of all these other considerations, we know from Hume that the future isn't necessarily conformable to the past, right? So if you're looking at it purely practically in terms of causal effect, I don't like the world that is generated if we don't factor in concepts like free will. That's that's why I want to factor that in, right? Um, could, I, okay. could, I answer, could I answer that really quickly? Yeah, please. Um, so I don't think it necessarily follows from the fact that something is causally determined um, that it's predictable in the sense that we can um, uh, proactively set up institutions and, and programs to uh, catch criminals before they catch the crime or before they commit the crime, right? Uh, or, or to, to you know, euthanize um, babies that that are genetically predisposed to I don't know uh, become murderers someday. Um, really, we should uh, be isolating the traits that make people certain not to do that and just kill everybody else. Serious, and then Max. Okay. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm, what, what, I'm, what I'm saying is that it, it, I, I don't think it necessarily follows from the fact that that these things can be determinative, um, that it's therefore predictable and that they're therefore actionable. Yeah. Uh, so we'll that so, later, but yeah. Okay. Yeah. Here. So I, I want to say, I completely disagree with uh, Jalma. Is that how you pronounce it? Yeah, roughly. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. No, it's um, a weird name. Don't worry. Yeah. So I completely disagree with you. I think that the the affirmation of like a libertarian sense of free will is one of the most destructive political forces or political ideas that there's ever been in all of history like okay, it's the basis of all conservative thought uh, this isn't a libertarian right? view of free will just just to clarify on that one point like i'm not a libertarian in any sense whatsoever i'm a pragmatist materialist basically so anyway yeah so uh, th this is this is why this is why uh and if i may interrupt this is why I, I was saying that we already were discussing the moral the moral implications of free will, and I said let's talk about freedom first because depending on how we define freedom, we're gonna get to different answers. And this is why I was going back to the question of should we first describe what we mean by freedom? Because yeah, I already so, gave my definition. Uh, I can give yeah, you yeah, so, yeah, can I, let, Let's seriously yeah. hang on. Let, let's seriously finish this point, and then yeah, I so, want Max to be able to jump. So in. I, I think that um, so I just take free will to be 
acting on a reason or doing something on a reason. So, or based on a reason. So, um, so if I choose to go to, um, I don't know, if I choose to eat vanilla instead of chocolate ice cream, I'm acting on reasons that are internal to myself. That's like, but I mean, I hang have... on. If I hold a gun to your head and tell you to pick vanilla, you're still acting on reasons internal to yourself. Now. Yes. Yes. So that's, the, no, that's the thing. I agree with that. I, I would say that like technically, like in a compatibilist sense, or at least the way that I define it, I would say that that is like a, a free choice. It's just that I don't think that that's, useful so like i i would take an unfree like action to just be like if you if so if the doctor hits your knee with the with the hammer and your reflexes cause you to spring up you didn't act on a reason there right and i think that there are um there's a reason for us to talk about free will in terms of acting on reasons or in that or talk about free will in this sense because then we can say okay what reasons do people act on and how do we give them different reasons such that they will act in ways that we find preferable or like fulfill some greater purpose so i i think that the acknowledgement though that ultimately it, it's reducible down to like the reasons people have for acting means that it gives us the idea that we should give people different reasons for acting. I don't think that it actually does what Jama says, which Can is I that just I seriously is somewhat misrepresenting the position in a way that I think it would benefit from some clarity because I think we're actually agreeing with each other. Okay. Um, sure. The key part of what I was saying, I may have overstated, you know, the case for free will as some as being adjacent to some kind of libertarian conception of oh my god, you just have to triumph over your circumstance, blah blah. What was important about the account that I was providing was that the behavior in the instance of assuming free will is not causally determined by the past. It is you have a reason to act, even an impulse to act that is not stuck in a causal chain, but is somehow separate from it, whether it's responsive to it, whether it's closer to instinctual, whether it's just a reason to act. Hard one. And so we're actually very much agreement about this and i think that my apologies to victor for not being there earlier when he was defining these different concepts because i think that the equivocation that can happen across disciplines and within disciplines is a really big issue when it comes to these concepts so i may have overstated what i was saying it was but to me the important factor is whether or not external past circumstances determine the action or whether we have reason to act that is somehow internal or separate from those actions right so okay but i don't think that necessarily you I don't think that you choose how you respond to given reasons. Like, I don't think that that makes any sense. But that's like, a separate point. The point, but you can say, I don't think you choose how to respond, but are you responding the way you're responding because A led to B, B led to C, and C led to your current response? Or are you responding instinctually from some other internal mechanism? Because you yeah, still but those internal mechanisms are still rooted in something that's like not you, right? Like you could say that you okay. were in so shaped environmentally, yeah. right? So, so that clarifies the position, right? Okay. So if that's what you mean, if that's all that you mean, and we talk about free will in the sense of like, we should give people reasons to act that lead to consequences that we think are instrumentally valuable, then sure. I, I, I would agree with that. I was just going to push back on, I, I just think that that's a little bit different. And it gives us the idea that we should construct institutions that incentivize people to behave certain ways and with the acknowledgement that like it's not an essential part of their being that they behaved a certain way and that they they can behave differently there is the possibility that they yeah could I have that into it. so i think there's three things going on here right so the first thing is the extent to which current actions are determined by past actions the extent to which our responses to those things are these kind of free choice instantiations of lib a libertarian ethos or whether those are just reactions that arise spontaneously that maybe are partially or fully determined by the past. Like there's three separate things we're discussing here. And then we're discussing how much any of this should factor into discussion about how to arrange institutions. Like there's, these are the four parts of this discussion, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Max. Yeah, uh... yeah um, I think I generally agree with King Crocoduck's conclusions where I don't think like libertarian free will versus uh, sort of a compatibilist free will uh, really changes your position on something like moral responsibility of some sort of like agents, like some sort of moral agents. 
Um, but I would probably disagree how you get there. So for me, how I would get there is I would just make a distinction between natural kinds of things and then like artifactual kinds of things and corporate entities. So for instance, if we have like a chair and um, the chair comes into existence because the efficient cause of the chair is going to be someone intending to build a chair, right? Um, and that's going to create something where, you know, it's like it's a whole thing and you can say it exists independent of the mind, but it, like you can reduce all its causal powers back to what it's made out of. So if it's like made out of wood, then it has like this disposition to rot away, you know, as a, as a uh, you know, an agglomerate of a bunch of pieces of wood. Um, now, uh, you can also have corporate entities. And so I think of corporate entities sort of like, for instance, you could think of like sectors in a macro economy, like, um, like the household sector, which, uh, you know, saves and consumes as sort of a collection of a lot of different people. Um, you can treat that sort of like a substance philosophically, I guess, but it doesn't really make any sense to call that an object. It's just, um, you know, an agglomeration of different people, right? Or like we could talk about the government, right? That's another corporate entity. Um, and none of these things require us to reduce all of like um, its explanatory power back to um, like what it's built off of when it comes to like actual natural kinds of objects, right? There's no reason why we have to appeal to that except in certain like circumstances when we talk about like the psychology of a human being or their childhood development, et cetera, et cetera. And so there are interesting edge cases there where, um, you know, maybe we have to like parse that out in some way, but um, I don't know. It just doesn't like, for the majority of the entities that you're dealing with, it just doesn't seem like that matters that much. We're like talking about prisons. We're talking about like all these different things, which I think are both artifacts or corporate entities. The second point I wanted to make was, um, I, I, maybe I don't really understand the objections to libertarianism. This isn't really like my sort of field of philosophy, but if you like define determinism as like, you know, given the state of affairs at event E1, index of time T, or specified and the world is governed by laws of natural sciences, that means that event E2, index of time T plus N necessarily follows. So um, it seems like determinism would be false if we could find out um, that there are certain events which uh, don't necessarily follow given all of the sort of things that we have there. So that could be an empirical question, or it could be the case that in the sciences, we just know when um, something is in like not determined and something is determined and we can like, um, you know, just commit to our best theories, which determine that, or it could be the case that um, like, you know, a priori, we just say like, Oh, any case, like any sort of situation where we add like, you know, some sort of error variable or some sort of, um, you know, more probabilistic aspect to a model that's not like referring to a physical kind of thing. And so we're not, we're just automatically not going to commit to that because in like principle, it could possibly be explained deterministically. Um, and then I guess like the second question is then, um, I'm not really sure what the uh, objections would be like it would be an empirical question i guess because it would have to assume that alternate possibilities exist in a way that we can control them um and i'd be guessing that would be something like um choosing between different ways that we like will our separate desires um to commit to some sort of action or something like that so i i guess maybe i think determinism might be an empirical question but i don't think libertarian free will is a and is a uh is a an empirical question. I think it's conceptually incoherent to say that we have any libertarian free will. So, like, I I, I ha find it hard to even entertain questions like, you know, if we lived in a universe with libertarian free will, would our justice system change? Because, like, that's to me, that's like asking, what if we lived in a universe with a square circle in it? Like, I think, yeah, I kind of want to hear the objections. That's all I was like asking. I yeah, guess. sure. So I can give the objections. So basically. When we talk about free will, what the in the libertarian sense, we're talking about an un, something that's uncaused. So it's an uncaused action. It has no antecedent causes, right? No, and, no, no, no. I was disputing that fact because it could just be the case that there are multiple possible effects that come from a single cause. Um, well, but in a libertarian like, sense, they hmm. would deny that, right? Like a libertarian, libertarian free will 
says. Or... No, because you would just place that where you like will towards something. So if you're undetermined be between how you will towards something, then that um, like supervenes on some physical process that is indeterminate and um, like allows for the real possibility to choose one way to act or another way to act. Okay, so, so can we just add another dimension into this because I'm sort of noticing something coming up in the discussion that might be helpful. Sunday, is that okay if I just slightly shift the dialogue? Yes, and then me after. Okay, so basically one of the issues that we have, so first of all, I don't think that, how do I put it? Adhering to a deterministic view is necessarily going to lead to arranging institutions in such a way that predetermines behaviors and then calculates for them, even though we know that from the history of eugenics that has happened before, right? Um, so I don't think that's necessarily going to follow. I don't think that claim follows from the claim I'm making. So I have to say that like, I'm more or less siding with Croc in that level. Um, and then the additional point was, I think a huge issue when we're talking about the nature of choice, um, response, intuition, free will, etc., is to work on the cause constitution error, right? So just because somebody was formed in such a way does not mean that is the full explanation for the way they are. Because there's a third way of looking at free will here, which is neither libertarian nor kind of like uh, physicalist impulse based or something that adheres to that. And the third way is a sort of phenomenal logical view, right? And that, that view would amount to something like the person not fully identifying with their history, being able to break from it, not just through this kind of, you know, free choice, you know, my freedoms libertarianism, but because they have an outside view or because they've developed an ability to kind of meta-analyze their existence, right? So we, if you're a phenomenologist, you, you have to kind of accept there's other things in the world aside from the things that have happened to you and aside from the choices you make that make up the type of being that you are. So um, I think it's really important not to to commit the cause constitution error in making having these discussions. Yeah, um, I guess I want to sort of say one more thing. I'm not really sure what any of these positions would like politically entail, right? We could say maybe in the past, you know, determinists had weird ideas of things and we can say like fatalism is one type of determinism. And that's very different from like a causal determinism because that just says like there are certain events that'll happen despite any of the causal chains that we appeal to, despite, you know, any sort of whatever, like like normal defenses of determinism, right? Um, and so prediction also doesn't, um, you know, entail, like uh, determinism doesn't entail anything about like our capacity to predict people's behaviors either. Um, I don't think any of these views entail really anything on like the political level, to be completely honest. I just want to second that. I don't think they do it all either. Yeah. Um, there's a word that keeps coming up in this conversation, and I think it'll be worthwhile to explore it further. That word is cause and our understanding of causality uh, in relation to, to this issue. So the way that I'm hearing determinism characterized is... A happens and then B happens and then C happens. And, you know, if we speak in terms of probability, the probability of B happening after A happens is one. Um, causality in this sense is, is a regularity um, that occurs with probability one. And I think that this characterization of causality can be misleading in these discussions um, because I see causality uh, in the practical sense as being fundamentally probabilistic. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to think of how to, how to put it best into words, but. I do think I'm going to completely agree with everything you have to say though, because I've been waiting for this point of view. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, take, take an example that I'm really fond of, which is butterflies and hurricanes. Um, so uh, a hurricane, as with uh, any fluid dynamical system, is the result of zillions of particles that are interacting with one another in a way that's very difficult to predict. They're interacting determin uh, deterministically. Um, you know, they are obeying very simple laws of physics, but you're accumulating zillions of them. And um, they have certain properties, especially in fluid mechanics, that makes them particularly difficult to treat. And this is why, for example, you know, uh, weather forecasters uh, ne never get it right beyond a, a certain 
certain interval. And even then, you know, within that interval, they, they, they can they can frequently be wrong. Um, and in the case of a hurricane, um, this is this is a system of such enormous complexity um, that uh, you, you have so many zillions of particles uh, that, as, as the old adage goes, a butterfly fluttering its wings on the opposite side of the Earth um, will... Well, uh, actually, the old adage is wrong. It says that the that the butterfly causes the hurricane. That's not actually quite right. The the fluttering of the butterfly's wings prevents us from being able to predict whether the hurricane is going to happen or not. Yeah, because and... the, the way that I think. Oh, do you want to say there? Sorry. Oh, uh, um, I I think I think my point is made. Okay, because the way I hear people describe determinism often is like x equals y plus z, when the way I think of it is x equals n, where y plus z is in the element of n, it is one of the um, it's one of the things contained in the set of n, and n is the total possible range of answers. Determinism is something will happen, and to me, free will is the ability to influence those variables. And for me, this is Marx's huge contribution to materialism, which is the idea that humans are not subject to determinism; we are an active part in determining the outcome. We have the ability to influence um, the range of variables within the equation. That that is what it is to me. Well, I, yeah, yeah. Um, I, like that, I like that definition. I'll let King Croc answer that, but I wanted to answer King Croc on something after. So I, I kind of wanted to say something too. Um, but yeah, okay. you can talk. Uh, Croc, uh, answer, then Max, and then yeah, and uh, Sirius. Did you want some, to say something as well, or no? Okay, fair enough. King Croc, go. You're muted, Sirius. Heads up. Um, no contest. Okay, Max. Yeah, so I think I read some book. I think it's called like um, Causality uh, in the Sciences or whatever. It was like a book by um, uh, Sirius. Who's the person who does a lot of like the causal powers um, stuff? And they wrote like the very short introduction to causality. What's his name again? I, you know I don't, wait, I have no idea. I'm sorry. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so I think the problem when we appeal to, right, in certain scientific theories, we appeal to not a totally deterministic model, but a model that has certain, like, uh, you know, Stephen Mumford? Uh, more prop yeah, Stephen Mumford. Yeah, that guy. Um, I read a book by him. Um, we appeal to, you know, probabilistic, um, uh, certain models that are probabilistic. Now, the problem, I guess, with this case then is are we talking about like this epistemology first? sort of way of going about it, or this like ontology first way of, uh, of going about it. And I, the only problem I have with like the epistemology first um, sort of approach is that it seems like one, we're dodging the question. And then two, like, it's very hard to even talk about cause and effect if we're not um, sort of just presuming it, right? We're just presuming it's the case that it always is there. And so he gives like an example with like a counterfactual theory of causation where he says like, you know, um, if I hit this uh, window with my hammer, then it'll break. You know, I hit the window with my hammer, therefore it'll break, right? So that necessarily follows uh, from, I guess, those two premises, just a simple modus ponens. And so um, he says, you know, what premise are you going to reject to? If you reject premise two, then it's just like not the case that, you know, that wouldn't hammer caused uh, the window to break and it would just still be there. That doesn't really make, that doesn't really do anything when it comes to causality. If you reject first premise, then it seems like um, there would be some other explanation for why it's the case that the window didn't break. Um, but that doesn't tell us anything about like cause and effect not existing. It'll just be like an instance of that situation um, not causing the window to break. And so at least to me, it seems like it's really hard to like Think of a world without, um, you know, this uh, without cause and effect. And it seems like um, if we appeal to cause and effect, at least it gives us a lot of like explanatory power um, uh, across like many disciplines of thinking about certain things. And um, uh, that's all I would really add. I don't really um, like like that's very armchairy, but all philosophy is kind of armchairy. And so uh, you have to make these distinctions between like the epistemological, the ontological, ontological, etc. Yeah, I, yeah. Well, putting, think, putting my cards on the table, I'm definitely on the epistemological end of things when it comes to causality. Uh, me too. Uh, 
I, I, I don't know. I, I, I just take a pragmatist approach. Like, um, I don't remember who proposed it, but somebody proposed basically a Pascal's wager about causality, where either we live in a world where causality works, or we live in a world where it doesn't work and guesswork is just as good. So we should always behave as if we are, as if causality or induction, I guess, works, because otherwise it's irrelevant or immaterial that we behaved one way or the other. Yeah, sense. and specific theories of causality also don't apply to um, every single like usage of the term cause and effect. Like if you uh, take like an econometrics course on causal inference, you're not talking about like substances causing changes in other substances, right? You're talking about causality in a much broader cross apply like, causal sense. inference from one. So here's the thing: I think the point you're making is really good, and I think even the most like in sentential logic, even you have the points. So you know, we have this idea of a condition that's necessary to bring about this result, um, a condition that's necessary and sufficient, and a condition that's merely sufficient. So in other words, you could have, it is necessary that um, for me to live, there be oxygen in the room, but it's not sufficient for me to live that there be oxygen in the room. I have to eat and do other stuff as well. So it's, it's one of these things that not all causes are going to be fully necessary and sufficient. Um, and I think the interesting thing that comes out of this, uh, Zane, I kind of liked the way you were talking about X equals N, but then N has all these other things inside it. Um, and how King Croc was talking about, you know, a butter the butterfly effect and a butterfly can flip its wings on one side of the universe and everything can can go to hell, basically. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm reiterating it stupidly. Um, but nonetheless, in both of those frameworks, what you're what you're getting at is even if it is highly. So there's two things that could happen. Well, first thing even if it is highly improbable and in fact miraculous that something should exist, you can have a fully necessary and sufficient cause that's absurd for some resultant effect. The second thing is that we're never going to know what causes are necessary or sufficient. We have the issue of the epistemic barrier. In other words, what's blocking us from accessing reality, right? Our own minds. So, we're in a situation where we will, because we are complex beings that aren't simply effects of causes, that would be, I agree, if everyone's saying the cross application would be kind of ludicrous. We're never going to know what the full explanation for our behavior is. And so I think as we're all kind of hinting at, epistemic humility is a really important thing in this conversation, right? Yeah, but um, I think I was, um, I, I don't think you addressed what I was saying, which was something more like along the lines of, it, it kind of makes sense to just assume like, cause and effect is like, I don't know, like how things like interact, because uh, we can say that for like any individual effect, it's not the necessary condition for um, how it's like come to be, right? Um, but then it seems like we would just find some other effect, uh, some, uh, some other like cause, which is sufficient to bring about that effect that we observe. Right. And so it doesn't seem like we ever like ex escape that, you know, that's that's all I'm sort of saying, um, because like we have to presume that it's going to be the case. You can't like you can't uh, assume that there's just something that's cause uh, that's something that's a uh, some sort of you, you observe some sort of effect. And then like there's nothing that caused it to be that way. That's that seems like that would be really um, bad, like um, I guess, like epistemically. So I. So I, I, just in case I've completely botched what you mean by that, are you saying that it's wrong to presume that there is a cause for an event? No, 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 no. I'm saying the opposite. Okay. I'm saying that we have okay, to assume yeah, okay. cause and effect because it seems like if we just say we observe an effect, but it just didn't have like a cause, right? So we would say that like for a specific effect, maybe it's not necessary that um, the cause that like we hypothesize is sufficient to bring that about, right? Um, yeah. But we would look would for another cause. As well. Yeah, we would just look for another cause. We wouldn't just say like, oh, it just popped out of existence. Yeah, that would have been my position as well, that it's like while the idea that every event has a preceding cause, it is an assumption. It's an assumption reasoned to that to be moved off it, you would need to provide me um, an explanation that is as as powerful as an explanatory tool and answers more. Um, that's essentially the principle of the scientific method. Um, I, I don't remember how it came up, but there was one thing that I wanted to say in terms of um, if you were to take like science and just take like physics, um, you can basically break physics up into two parts, very crudely and rudimentary, theoretical and experimental. 
Um, the only time where physics isn't probabilistic is in its theoretical form, and that is because it presumes independence from the world itself. And what they mean by that is it presumes independence of you, the experimenter. The best example I can give would be the ideal gas laws. No gas works the way those laws presume they are. And anytime you experimentally engage with the world, what you have to do, and you are taught this, and you won't pass your university undergraduate if you're not able to do this, you need to be able to calculate error. You need to be able to show that there is a, a necessary ambiguity in your result, and you can produce the error bars to say that um, I've calculated gravity between these values. It's it's utterly probabilistic, and you're saying like, like if my error bar is plus or minus three, I'm providing like six answers. It's one of those, and the reason is because we introduce error, and like the philosophical term for that is like. Um, we introduce variance and we don't know what the outcome of that will be. Um, or, I think that's or, such an important thing to put in. Or you can just go into the social sciences. I, I know King Crawford. Yeah, can I, can, so can I give a, a couple of insights? Yeah. Yeah. On the social first sciences, all, you're going to be using statistical inference. So. Yeah. First of all, I, I wanted to say uh, first of all, I wanted to say something. Um, somebody said that in uh, the econometrics definition of causality is one. Uh, I mean, the econometrics definition of causality and, and normally the definition that is used in this kind of statistics is the ceteris paribus effect. Okay, The ceteris paribus effect is the effect that something has keeping everything else constant. That is what, in a sense, is called the causal effect. Okay, is keeping everything else constant. If I increase this variable by one unit or by a very small amount, okay? How does the dependent variable change? That oh, no, I'm not way. talking about like the microeconomic theories. I'm more talking about the fact that like, um, if you do certain experiments, then you can um, say that you meet more of like the sufficient conditions of inferring that like this is causal and it's not just like a correlation. So, you know, if you do yes. like an experiment where it's like you have a treatment here and then you have a different treatment there, and then you have like a control. It's like you can infer causation because you actually like control for um, the because specific you get everything else constant exactly. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, so yeah. That is in a sense yeah. the, the definition that we're working. But 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 in this sense, I, I want to bring a little bit uh, of of my own insight into the conversation of free will, because uh, I, and 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 I want back. I want to go back a little bit to the definition of freedom, because for me, talking about whether something is free or not. Is really um, a binary here that that I think it's uh, not useful, okay? Because I I have a lot of uh, dialectical influence in my thinking. Now, in my sense, okay, freedom is a thing that comes in degrees. Okay? There are different degrees of freedom, and freedom, as I was saying at the beginning of this uh, uh, stream, refers to the ability to act, and it is not a purely human ability, okay? Other uh, animals, for example, have the ability to act, and these. Uh, is in a sense something that we can refer to as freedom. They have degrees of freedom. Okay, they have things that they can act upon, things that they can control, that they uh, things that they can do. And this is important because in 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 this sense, okay, uh, humans have degrees of freedom. Okay, we can we can, uh, for example, act in this way or in this other way uh, based on the things that we can actually do. Okay. And this is a positive definition of freedom that I'm using, of course. Now, in this sense, what determines uh, the different paths of action that we can take? Well, our will is certainly part of that thing. Okay. Now, the question is: this free? Uh, is this will free or not? Okay. This is again a question that to me doesn't make too much sense because to talk about whether our, our, our will is free is again talking about this ideal of freedom. And I don't believe in this idea of freedom. So in this sense, our, our, will, our will is obviously not free. Our will is obviously uh, has degrees of freedom, but nevertheless, it's neither free or unfree, okay, in this sense of this pure dynamic, uh, this pure uh, binary. Now, in this sense, does free will exist? We have indeed the freedom to act in certain ways that, that, that our will directs us to at given points in time, and we have uh, those freedoms. Nevertheless, nevertheless, the question of whether those freedoms are uh, whether those actions are caused or not by other things in the past doesn't really matter that much and this is what i was saying at the beginning uh, to this question okay it doesn't really matter to this question because what i say freedom is is the ability to act now 
our ability to act is constrained by many factors. So obviously our ability to act is not free in this absolute sense. It has certain degrees of freedom, others not. So free will doesn't exist because there is no such thing as freedom, as the freedom, as being able to act unconstrainedly. And our will is obviously constrained. And this is why I don't believe in free will. Nevertheless, I believe that we have the freedom to act in certain occasions, and this also goes back to the to the notion of uh, the moral implications of this question, because if we decide by our will, which is, pre in my opinion, it is determined, okay? And then we can talk about the notion of causality and that, but it is determined, our will is determined by a set of, by a wide range of factors, some which are biological, some which are purely physical, okay? Social factors, whatever. Uh, uh, once we act, Okay, these actions that we do have a, an effect on the world and have an effect on other people and have an effect on the larger society. And therefore, a, the moral question really involves this. Okay, it involves not whether we are a, free in this metaphysical sense that I don't really understand that well, that I, that I think it's non-existent, of a, whether we are free in this sense or not, doesn't matter. What matters really are the actions. What matters are the actions, and this is where the moral part of the question really uh, comes sure. into question. Sure, I mean you can, you know, uh, just say that virality requires. Okay, Matt, hang on, hang on, Max, then uh, Jama, and then um, if anybody else wants to say anything, just say so in private chat, and then we're going to wrap it up because we're going for almost two and a half hours, and I think we'll continue this next week. Yeah, I go, I'm going to so. dip right now. Actually, uh, I have been neglecting filial duties, so I'm going to get going. I was going <laughs> to say the chat. Yeah, no, thanks for a good time out. talking to you. Hey, yeah. Good seeing you, Crocodile. Likewise, uh, you, everyone. You. Have a good one. Again, um, I just want to make two points, right? So one is like, we can say like morally, you know, what's sufficient is just intentions plus actions. You can just say like, oh, that's sufficient for, um, you know, talking about like, uh, you know, moral responsibilities, liabilities, etc. And, you know, that's fine. You know, we can agree on that. The second thing, though, is like, I feel like I did an okay job like explaining libertarian free will and libertarian free will is not the idea that you can act unconstrained, right? There could be a limited amount of possibilities, but it just means that um, when you're deliberating, when you're using your will, there are actual alternate possibilities. Um, so there could just be two possibilities. There could be three possibilities. At certain times, there could be one possibility. Um, but that's ultimately, like I said before, one, an empirical question, and then two, um sort of like a methodological question of how you interpret like um you know certain like uh neuroscience studies or whatever and um you know that requires us to find the physical processes where we're doing where we're trying to make these alternate where we're trying to deliberate on these alternate possibilities and seeing whether or not that is undetermined i'm not sure so, i see a substantive distinction there though um, because you're still you're still taking the willing by itself and you're treating the the options quote unquote as if these are a thing that have an existence apart from its willing but i mean technically like we, we have how many different axes of, of movement in any given time we have how many different like uh completely irrational responses we could have to any any given set of circumstances um like we can we can really have an innumerable innumerable amount of array of options so to speak, in any given situation. Yeah, yeah, but th these are. Um, but the, the thing is, is that um, the, the the willing supervenes on some physical process, which is important, right? And it has to be the case that the physical process is um, uh, indeterminate, right? That's all I'm saying. But it's a process. Um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> you could still talk about modalities in the context of processes. I don't, I don't know what you're saying. But... No, you can, but like. The, the characterization of these things as options in the first place seems to presuppose some kind of uh, parity when the fact that one is chosen by reference to a process that is distinct from those those options themselves emerging as such on this framing um, doesn't seem to necessitate that. So the question is, why why are we regarding these specific things as options in the first place? Like that, that seems to be what the libertarian framework seems to um require whether whether you take it to extremes is like trying to like I, I mean it seems to me you're still operating in a sense of trying to have willing transcend itself even in order to frame these things as 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 options in a meaningful sense so all i'm saying is that um whatever the underlying 
I, I'm not really sure I understood like your um, sort of um, what you just said, but all I'm saying is that um, instead of saying that effect ne necessitates the effect necessitates from um, all of the you know states of affairs in the prior event, um, it's possible that you can have multiple states of affairs, and so it's just the act of willing which is just this physical process or well can be reduced back into this physical process and like a whole part relationship that um, causes us to actualize one event or another event. And that's all I'm saying. Well, that's from the standpoint of perception, there can be possible states of affairs. But no, 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 this is, no, this is a, this is a statement about what exists. I, I don't know how you would establish that, but okay. Uh, like I said, it depends on how you actually interpret these studies. And this is like a hypothetical. I don't, I don't think this like really exists. So. No, but you're making, you're making an ontic claim now. You're not, you're not talking about yes. something that can be referred to an empirical study, right? Um, no, 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 no. That's what I'm saying is like one, well, it's an empirical study, but it depends on how you interpret the study that you can make that distinction. Right. So there's two layers to it. You have to somehow say that. For this conversation. Sorry, Jalma, you were going to Yeah, say no, something. I am too, so. <laughs> yeah, no worries. It's all good. Uh, Jalma and then uh, Victor and Zen, you've been a bit quiet, and then we'll, we'll wrap up. We'll continue this next week, so we don't need to, this doesn't need to be like the definitive statement on any of this. Yeah, and honestly, like, um, Max, I want to kind of engage with what you're saying a little, a little bit more detail next week, and I just had one very brief comment for once um, about what Victor had just said, because I find it really interesting. Um, Victor, in a way, I think that your view of how to describe it, um, choice and freedom really in your in the in, from the standpoint of freedom from and freedom to um somewhat mirrors a compatibilist account in a more kind of strictly analytic sense and i find that really nice and interesting and i think there's a lot of potential there and so one thing i wanted to bookmark for next week was what is the role of the concept of freedom from because i'm starting to come around to the idea that negative freedoms that don't um, allow for an immediate choice, but open up the possibility of choosing or at least reacting might be really powerful and might add and flesh out, add to and flesh out a more analytic account. So I kind of want to get into, I know you, I know you choose not to incorporate that into your account, but I want to talk about that a bit more and kind of push on the concept of negative freedom a bit more, um, just as a bookmark for next week, if you're available. So, uh, let me respond briefly to that. I don't know if I'm going to be uh, available, so uh, but in any case, we can always uh, come back to this conversation. Mm -hmm. What I would say is that to me, um, the freedom from in, is is encompassing this definition in, in this following sense, okay? Uh, and, and you can tell me if you agree with this. Um, since I defined a freedom in terms of the capacity to act, and it is not exclusively a human. Uh, attribute, okay, because other other agents, other beings can can act. Uh, this ability is not only determined by the things that we can do, in the sense of the things that uh, that 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 we have um, the the capacity to do, in, in in the sense of we have the the arms and legs, uh, the, we have the legs to walk. Exactly, we have, um, let's say, I have a pencil that I can write with. All of these things. But this also encompasses the things that we don't have, okay? And what is what does this mean? For example, if I were chained to the ground, if I were chained, I, I don't have the ability to walk, even though I have legs. So I have things that are necessary for me to walk in this in this sense. Okay, oh, you can talk about uh, prosthetic legs, okay? But in, any form of leg, okay, which are necessary for me to walk, but nevertheless, I am chained. Therefore, there is one thing that is impeding my capacity to act. And since I define freedom, as the capacity to act, and I don't care whether uh, this capacity comes from a, a... I don't care at this stage of analysis. Of course, I do care at another stage of analysis. But at this stage of analysis, I don't care if this is uh, this capacity to act. Uh, the action itself is done by uh, by uh, an agent that is unconstrained or not, in, in the sense of there's another substance that determines your action, you know, that... Uh, at this stage, I don't really care about that. What I care really is about the capacity to act. Since there is something that is impeding this capacity to act, to act, then I don't have that degree of freedom. I don't have the freedom to walk because I'm chained. Yes. So that is... I, that's a really good analogy. And I think that you know, a powerful way of looking at negative freedoms is freedom from external impediments. 
And so I think what I would next week, I'm not going to do this just now, how I'd want to continue the discussion is to talk about whether or not causal determinism is um, giving in fully to a set of external impediments as fully framing one's capacities or something like that. Like I want to kind of find a way to bridge this from a political, from a philosophical discussion, pure form into a political discussion. And I don't, don't um, pin anything I'm saying as my definitive stance. I'm just starting to think through the ways we could work with this, this notion of freedom from external impediments um, and link that into the way in which causal determinism might operate in certain frameworks. Like there's just something interesting there that I, I want to explore later, maybe. And it might just be a bunch of shit. I'm not sure yet. So that's but, where- but the, they are really important. And, and, and you and you pointing this out is, is a, a very nice because there are really important implications, policy implications in terms of politics and economics to this question. And this is why uh, at some point I want to get, uh, not in this conversation, but at, at a later point, I want to get to, mm -hmm. the, to the implications for economic methodology and for policy uh, analysis and for policy decision making. Because um, this notion of freedom that I work with okay, is completely at odds with a definition of freedom that says human beings are free if there is no thing in paper or in practice that stops them from doing one thing. And in this sense, okay, you can say, well, Freedom is good because uh, for some ocean economists, for example, they say, and for neoclassical economists, they say if people are free to act, they will act according to their better judgment. They will act according to what their preferences and they maximize their utility. And this act of maximization leads to the optimal outcome, to the Pareto optimal outcome. And, and to me, this is purely a mytho mythology because to me freedom obviously cannot just be defined in that sense because everything that we what, that we do is based on these degrees of freedom that I was talking about the capacity to do things and yes maybe I am uncon I am uncon sorry I am yes I am unconstrained in this sense of maybe there's no not no one pointing to my head with a gun telling me to do something okay maybe that is a constraint that I don't have but there are many other things okay that stop me from a acting okay, in certain ways and yes maybe uh, and this also goes back to the th to theories about preferences and all that and i don't want to get into those questions okay so what i what just what i want to say is that with this notion of freedom that i'm presenting we can develop a, a really nice defense of a political a, a policy making that i that i that i support in terms of socialism communism and that and yeah. we can have certain uh, critiques of Capitalism, of course, because mm -hmm. by my definition of freedom, capitalism involves a certain set of unfreedom, a certain sense of lacks of the uh, lack of degrees of freedom, and this lack of degrees of freedom is one that I want to enhance. I want to create those freedoms, those degrees of freedom. I want to create for people the ability to act in certain ways that they cannot act right now, which are freedoms that they don't have. But this uh, notion gets polluted a lot. And here in Spain, we have this uh, politician in Madrid who, who is the president of Madrid. Uh, she's a woman uh, called uh, Isabel Diaz Ayuso. And she ran, and this is no joke, she ran, okay, as president of the community of Madrid on the motto of communism or freedom. Oh, God. <clears throat> So, so this is this is the kind of uh, defini this is the kind of notion of freedom that I'm trying to mm. really uh, get past with the the one that I'm presenting, which is I think is more, I mean I don't even know what she means by freedom there. Of course, I, I know what she means at as a, at a certain level, but you know once you start making this thing about all oh, the freedom and then communism is uh, unfree because of because it doesn't allow for the freedom, you know. And what is the freedom? Well, what I'm saying is there are degrees of freedom. Mm -hmm. And what I want is to enhance those degrees of freedom, to create more degrees of freedom, and to eliminate other degrees of freedom. Pursuant to that very noble mission, I'm going to let Zan Z sign us yeah. off so we can all go <laughs> and do things and stretch our legs. Zan, do you have any final comments I, to make? Uh, yeah, I, I can like get into like a seven-hour thesis on expanding everything, but I, I largely agree with the way Victor is um outlining this i mean we're both marxists of course we agree on this um fundamentally one of the things that i do think is very important and how i understand this though is that i think freedom and morality have nothing to do with each other i think morality is overlay onto freedom in how it interacts with consequences and choices 
But I think a key part about how you, uh, the reason why is like I explained earlier in terms of using mathematics, um, uh, determinism is just that there is an outcome that is going to happen. And then I almost exploit the is or the is ought gap. If something is going to happen, you can't jump to an ought. So you can't presume a moral outcome from something that was going to happen. So for me, how it comes into that freedom and how it interacts and exactly in how Victor was getting at in terms of one of the things capitalism does is I think freedom is to a degree um, your available access to that countable infinity of outcomes. And I think one of the things that capitalism does through I, I guess I'd use an Althusserian perspective of interpolation with an ideology. It, it artificially narrows that countable infinity and moves you further along the process where it can predict with reasonable certainty specific outcomes, but it's an artificial process and isn't an authentic process presuming you had your own ability to navigate that maze on your own. Um, freedom is the ability to enact um, choice upon the world. It's the ability to create action. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you yeah, very much, um, everybody. Um, Victor, shout out your channel. Zen Z, shout out your channel. Max, shout out your channel. Go, Victor. Yeah, uh, my channel is uh, goes by my name, Victor Magariño. I also have a channel in Spanish, uh, which has my second name. But uh, I only uploaded one video, but I will be uploading more videos in the past. So if you are Spanish or you are a Spanish-speaking person, you can also see that on that channel. And I talk about uh, economics, about philosophy, all from a standpoint of, uh, from a Marxist standpoint. And yeah, that's it. Zan. My name is Zanzi on Twitch. I speedrun games on YouTube. I discuss politics. Um, I'm Irish. I come from an Irish position. Today, I actually released a video talking about the um, assembly elections in the north of Ireland. So if you're interested to find out how an Irish Marxist views colonialism on my island, go check that video out. Uh, Zanzi stuff is good. Go check that out. Seriously. Uh, Max, please. Yeah, uh, my YouTube is uh, Max the Confessor. I don't have any videos on it currently, um, but I'm going to put videos on it later. I don't really have any political commitments. Uh, I would say that I'm interested in everything from, you know, philosophy, economics, history, theology, church history, whatever. Um, and yeah, a pleasure to be here. So. Yeah, thanks for coming on. And uh, Jelma, of course, runs the Cathedral server. There will be a link in the description once this video is up. So if you want to communicate more with him, uh, you can follow that. And I think at some point in the future, Jelma. at some yeah. point in the near future, yeah. not, not, imminently but but soon we're going to be start uh having like regular reading groups and things like that there so there will be more content on that side of things going forward yeah so look out for that in the server and uh my name is ambrose in the server and um you know come say hi and that kind of thing so okay thank you everyone now get out <sighs>